temporary building encampment at 1530 Cornwall Avenue, a resolution exempting the drop-in center at 1530 Cornwall Avenue from state building code requirements in order to provide housing for indigenous persons consistent with the provisions of RCW 19.27. Before I turn it over to uh, the mayor, we do have at least 41 people signed up. So we're gonna, we're gonna have some, a lot of testimony tonight. So now I'll turn it over to Mayor Fleetwood. Okay, well, I believe Terry, you're going to uh, introduce the CARES Act implementation to begin. Yes, I'm going to so start I would just that. introduce Tara Sundin. Yeah. Good evening, Council. Um, as I've done the last few times you've met, I've been providing you with an update on the CARES Act implementation. I'm gonna try and go with 41 speakers, go a little more quickly than, than what I was planning to do. Um, as you know, Whatcom County, the city, and all of the small cities are receiving uh, funding from the federal government. It's coming through Commerce, called the CARES Act Relief Fund. Whatcom County has been awarded a little over 12 million, the city, 2.7, the small cities have been awarded uh, 1.2 million. We are going to need to submit for reimbursement from the state of Washington by October 31st of this year. So a couple of you are working with us and there's quite a bit of urgency to um, get our programs together and, and get money out to help those in need throughout our community. We've been coordinating quite a bit with Whatcom County. Um, Tyler Schroeder has uh, presented a plan to the, the County Council today, and I'm gonna show you that same kind of allocation tonight. Um, we are coordinating so that we can provide as many efficiencies as possible, as well as kind of pool our funds, rely on each other to help get th these dollars out um, while responding to the, the, our most urgent needs. Uh, we're also leaning on groups, um, with expertise in various areas. So we're leaning on our regional economic partnership for economic development guidance, as well as the food security task force, the child recovery task force, the digital infrastructure work group, which is focusing on getting some infrastructure to our school aged children, um, as well as um, more of our kind of formal advisory group. As a reminder, um, under the CARES Act, the relief fund can be used to cover costs that are necessary expenditures um, incurred due to COVID. Um, they are not um, to have been budgeted previously, so they're not to be used to make up for loss in tax revenue, for example. And then according to the Department of Commerce, um, there's a pretty broad uh, set of eligibility. And I'm just gonna share a screen. So this is, um, you've been hearing me talk about the various um, areas, especially economic and business response, housing and human services response and essential government services. But tonight showing you the allocation that we're um, recommending. Um, again, all told, we have a little over $6 million um, available to our community. Whatcom County is focused on the public health emergency response. That's our health department, unified command, um, testing, uh, PPE, even some of the PPE that was just purchased for uh, the Chamber of Commerce and our businesses is coming out of this pot. I'm gonna spend a little bit more time on the economic and business response here in a moment. I will mention that the city is, um, well, you just passed uh, the community development block grant. So we've actually got more than 700 coming in um, for child care, but this is just our CARES Act allocation. So we've got three, uh, 3.4 million for business response and another 3.4 million for food, housing and our human services response. And then in addition, the CARES Act was also focused on helping local municipalities with the costs that, that we're incurring. And so for, for the city of Bellingham, um, the technology upgrades to, to get our, our staff, the technology that they need to work from home is eligible here, as well as all of the staff and, and um, contribution and resources that we've pr provided to Unified Command. Those are just a couple of examples. 
So I want to take a moment to talk about business and economic recovery. Uh, the mayor formed a um, business assistance team. Uh, Council members Vargas and Lilliquist have been serving on that team, as well as um, members from Whatcom County. Um, we've been fortunate to have both Ferndale and Blaine join our team. Uh, the Regional Economic Partnership, the Whatcom Community Foundation, Small Business Development Center as well. And Darby um, Coles, that works for community development, has been kind of leading the charge here. Um, we've come up with a recommendation um, and we are developing criteria. It's actually pretty, pretty well developed at this point. Um, both, so I think I mentioned to you that we were looking at a variety of different options and we couldn't settle on just one. And so we are settling on three different kind of tactics. Um, for the city, even though the small cities loved this concept as well, they just weren't large enough to really, really focus uh, resources in this area. We're dedicating a portion, in our, our case, the city's portion to um, the city center in Fairhaven. One of our concerns has been about you know, just the face of our community, um, wanting to support our districts that um, kind of represent Bellingham. And so this, this, uh, this program will be focused on the ground floor. Um, and then the, the county's portion is gonna be allocated based on where the number of employees are located. So in the case of Bellingham, that means about $1.2 million is coming from the county to support Bellingham businesses. And um, a portion of that that's proportionate to the number of businesses will be coming into this pool. Um, so we'll see about 700,000 focused here and uh, just shy of a, a million dollars focused on, on citywide Bellingham businesses. And then another option was to um, focus on a sector and we have decided to maintain this focus on childcare. So, um, as we speak, uh, we've got people working on developing the application materials. Um, the criteria is going to be weighted on the need of the business, their ad adaptation or innovation to COVID, as well as their likelihood of success. Um, there are about a $15,000 maximum. We are looking at a grant program with, rather than a loan program. So we're very, very close, um, and I, I will be coming back to you here shortly with a budget ordinance. And then this should be also pretty familiar to you, not as much change here. I've, I've been hoping that we would have recommendations by now from the Food Security Task Force. I'm hoping we will very shortly. Um, but another $3.4 million going into this category the city is still focused on homelessness um, and food security. We do have some additional dollars outside of CARES Act that are going to be focused here on housing security. Um, behavioral health, that is a, a natural fit for Whatcom County Health Department. They're seeing some concerns and needs for support in that area. Um, this is to support the school districts uh, with their um, Purchasing is my understanding of technology to support the school children throughout the county. With that, what we're just looking for from council tonight is a general um, like nod that we're heading in the right direction. Um, we want to keep advancing these programs as fast as we can. I want to thank council members Vargas and Lilliquist. And um, if either one of you would like to say anything about the economic development response, um, we'd be happy to have you. Here I can say something really quickly. I just wanted to say that um, uh, what's been really impressive about this entire um, venture 
is uh, working, everybody working together with the port and with the county and the small cities um, and trying to make this happen as quickly as possible and combining our funds and combining our resources. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm really impressed with the amount of effort everybody put in because uh, we've been trying to turn this around as quickly as possible. So that's lots of meetings very quickly um, and everybody did whatever they could. So I, I just wanted to thank everyone for um, the collaboration it took to make this happen. Um, uh, so we can strengthen and help in regards to economic recovery. Go ahead, Dan, I saw your hand up. Thank you, Mr. President. As, <clears throat> if I recall correctly, there was a $700,000 uh, gap in the first year projections for the kids' world uh, for childcare. Does this um, 800,000, does this make us whole for a year or, or not? You know, we're not looking at um, that pot going to kids' world only. Not there. There are some other funds that Kids World's been receiving, but we are looking at supporting the small operators and mid-sized operators as well. Those that have been operating, but also those that need to get back online, and then some of the larger ones like the Y and um, Kids World. But we're not looking at just funding one. Probably a lot. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? Go ahead, Michael. Yeah, I'm gonna ask you to raise your hands because I've lost my uh, my side panel with the blue hands on there. So just go ahead and raise your hands and I'll find you. Um, okay, Gene, thank you very much. Um, so general comments, um, I really appreciate um, what we're doing with the CARE Act dollars. If I'm reading them correctly, we're, we as a city are only using less than half of those dollars that are coming to us to help our extraordinary causes. We're turning around and pushing the other larger half right out the door to help with housing and human services, to help with economic response, to help with childcare. And I, I echo what Councilmember Vargas said, uh, this works so much better in coordination with the county. They have areas with, where are nationally um, easy for them to emphasize because they have a health department and we do not. Um, and so the entire package makes far more sense than, than our package makes um, in isolation. So uh, generally speaking, I really appreciate the allocations. Um, I believe the Whatcom Restart Program, uh, we've kept it um, pretty simple. Uh, if you're a business that's affected by COVID-19 with a downturn and loss of income, and if you have a plan for recovery, and if you were healthy beforehand, you can qualify for a grant. And the idea is not so much to benefit that business, but to benefit every single one of us, uh, customers, employees, uh, the entire economy, to keep things moving. We're facing a historic economic downturn, and I think the best thing we can do is moving so people can take care of their business. So if you want a head nod, you got a head nod for me. Mr. Hamill. Given the the priorities uh, outlined in the packets and the, or the packet rather, and the allocations that are assigned to those priorities, um, I'm in favor and would also provide a head nod. Okay, Lisa. I just wanna thank you that you're doing grants and not loans. I think that's just a really important element. So I really appreciate the consideration that direction because all our businesses don't need to take on additional loans to get through this. Um, will other, um, not-for-profit qualify, things like the theater, um, some of uh, music venues, places that um, have really been impacted but are a bit of the flavor of what makes Bellingham wonderful. Are they gonna be able to qualify through this program to get a grant if they apply? Good question, and yes, we did have a thorough discussion about that and nonprofits are gonna be able to apply for those funds as well. Wonderful, then you have two head nods for that, thank you. Okay, anybody else? I think you got enough head nods there, right, Tara? Thank, yeah, thank you. Before we go to the next item, I just want to remind everybody, after the next item is when we'll open it up for public comments. So go ahead, we, go ahead, Mayor, next item. All right, thank you, Gene. Um, Council President Knutson. The, uh, the order that we're proposing tonight is that as it relates to this item, is going to be a presentation by um, people who've been working on 
the project regarding uh, lease terms for the emergency shelter. Then, Gene, what we're proposing is um, the public comment and then consideration by councils. I guess we're in agreement on steps. Okay, well, I'll just dive in then. So uh, thank you council members uh, for partaking in this special, special meeting tonight uh, to address an urgent <coughs> public health need. Um, I'm going to be going through some presenters that are going to uh, further introduce this item. We have uh, County Executive Scott Pauls to do who will speak um, after me. Then we're gonna hear from uh, Public Works Director Eric uh, Johnson, followed by Planning Director Rick Sepler, uh, followed by Tara Sundin. And then we're going to finish um, with Hans Urchinger uh, Davis. So I think everyone recognizes the situation that we're in and the necessity to uh, get out of uh, Bellingham High School. Uh, we were so grateful to partner with Bellingham High School. They came in um, at a critical time and offered that space and it's been enormously helpful. Um, so I want to extend thanks to the school district, particularly uh, Superintendent Greg Baker. Um, they need the site back by uh, no later than July 15th and for reasons that I think we all understand. They need to prepare the site for um, the school year. Uh, we all recognize that it can't return to the drop-in center in Old Town at the location on Holly Street. It's simply too small. It's not sufficient space to create uh, adequate uh, distancing. We further recognize that uh, there are uh, opposing views on the proposal tonight as it relates to the uh, public market site. And uh, we want to uh, do the very best we can. We're committed to helping navigate the issues, the concerns that have been expressed by some to ensure that those, those impacts are minimized to the extent that we're able. So we're very sensitive to that concern and uh, we'll be getting into some of those options that we have this, this evening. We just, we just don't have a choice. Um, we're in the midst of an emergency. We have to create healthy living spaces for people experiencing homelessness during this emergency health crisis, or they'll simply have no, no option as to where they can go. So protecting the health of people who need shelter services is going to greatly reduce the risk of COVID-19 outbreaks among shelter guests, among staff, amongst volunteers, and throughout the whole community. Uh, we're pleased to partner with Whatcom County in this effort and the Lighthouse Mission Ministries to uh, fill this vital community need. Uh, Sat Paul Sadu, uh, County Executive for Whatcom County, are you with us? Yes. Yes, I'm here, and uh, I just want to say good evening, Council, and uh, uh, Mayor Fleetwood, and the uh, President uh, Knudsen, uh, and all the other party spends. Uh, thank you for allowing me and the uh, county to present our uh, present our side of the view uh, for, for this issue. Uh, I think Whatcom County is totally committed to be the cooperative partner with city to address the needs of the most vulnerable residents. I recognize the urgency of the situation. Bellingham High School was gracious enough to help our community to allow to relocate the drop-in center at such a dire circumstantial, uh, circumstantial situation. I see the urgency of the task in front of city to commission a replacement space in a matter of few weeks. We all know that inaction is a terrible choice. This health emergency requires adherence to COVID protocols of social distancing for the shelter residents, the people who service them, as well as the visitors. I fully recognize that some members of, the, of, of our community have strong thoughts and feelings about the proposed location. Public market site is not the perfect site. 
I often said, perfect is enemy of good. Nobody would think that using a high school gym is a perfect solution for a homeless drop-in center. However, it did do the job. Rather, it do, did a great job. As a community, a response is needed, and it is needed in a short span of time. I would also like to talk about some of the suggestions made about south parking lots on the south side of the courthouse and the courthouse annex on the north side of the courthouse. The south parking lot is just one block from the businesses on the north commercial street, Grand Avenue, Prospect, Champion Street, like this is right there. And same is the case with courthouse annex. It's only 120 feet away from the south parking lot. And so the distances to the businesses is not great uh, as is being proposed that this could be a more further away space uh, uh, for this reason. When the search was made in March, I just want to bring it back uh, in, for the drop-in center, City did ask for this uh, North Annex uh, lot among other sites. We did a quick uh, uh, check over and we answered that this is not a suitable space. And then the Bellingham School uh, option came along as a site. Our reasons are still the same. From March to June, I don't think anything has changed. The space is next to Whatcom Creek. It is close to shoreline and setbacks are high. And the site has two levels with almost 25 feet elevation difference. So there will be several hoops to jump if even we consider that site and there will be very tight spaces that can happen only after a lot of earth moving operations. Now COVID-19 will be with us for next 12 to 18 months. Sheltering in place stopped in the past months. The disease is rapid spread and it did not Though it did not eradicate it, but it, we were very lucky that there were no serious outbreak at uh, Bellingham High School. Our county as a total did really well. We did not have serious outbreaks among the general population as it started, you remember, in Shuxon, as well as with the homeless community. By following public health advice and quickly creating a space for people who needed the shelter and adequate, adequate social distancing. I'm sure city will do their best to address community concerns. We as county health department are full and will and we'll do our best to minimize any potentially negative impact. Again, I want to re reiterate that Whatcom County will provide financial and public health support to make the transition successful. I encourage the council to act with compassion and urgency, and thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Executive Sadu. very much appreciated. At this thank time, you. I'm gonna hand it over to Public Works Director, Eric Johnston. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, and thank you, Executive Sidhu, for <clears throat> for those comments. I I, uh, I appreciate the way that this is introduced. We truly are in a need to respond to this emergency. The mayor's declaration of an emergency, the county executive, even the mayor, the the governor's declaration of this health crisis as an emergency, is something that the city staff, the county staff, and Unified Command take very seriously. Uh, the health of the health of our fellow community members is also something we take very seriously. And so as we have approached this particular topic, we have approached this with the mindset of caring for those who need the help the most in the context of the emergency that we are responding to. Uh, my comments today will be approached to the site selection and things that we have looked at with that, but I, I wanted to set that framework as how we are looking at this. 
Um, and as it contained in the staff memo in the packet today, uh, city staff have looked for a number of years uh, at locations for drop-in center and homeless facilities. Uh, so we are well equipped and well versed in background in, in identifying the needs for operation for those facilities, as well as the, the unique circumstances to serve this, this group of folks. Uh, one of the first activities that was undertaken under the emergency by Unified Command was the relocation of the drop-in center. And once that was completed, staff from Unified Command, the county and the city continued to look for an alternate location that would meet the long-term, uh, during the duration of this crisis, uh, needs of the drop-in center. And as part of that, engineers, planners, uh, and facilities experts at the city and the county conducted both paper reviews, meaning looking at uh, various properties uh, from a, a, a mapping perspective, looking at properties near the drop-in center location, and branching out beyond that to distances further away from the city and out into the county. Uh, we have looked at multiple locations for uh, options for building, building a new facility on vacant property, leasing existing space from vacant retail spaces, converting existing parking lots to, to temporary shelters. We have examined and looked at uh, temporary tents, more permanent tents. We have looked at modular buildings, we have looked at adapting existing buildings. Uh, we have looked at sites ranging from the old St. Joseph's Hospital to vacant retail spaces in the downtown, vacant retail spaces up, up all on Meridian, Guy Meridian, uh, dormitories at colleges and universities here in the community. In all of those examinations, we were putting, we needed to put that into the constraint of a couple criteria. And the largest criteria, the most important one, is one of time. As was mentioned earlier, we need to move the drop-in center from its temporary location of the high school to a different location to allow for the high school to be used for its primary purpose, which is for school in the fall. Uh, the, our target is the middle of July. So from today to the middle of July, we have roughly 30 days to stand up a facility that can serve this need. We also have limitations when it comes to cost. Uh, and all things being equal, if time was unlimited and costs would be unequal, we could find a perfect site, but that's not the case. We have limitations of time and money. In very brief, looking at the four or, four or five sites that are listed in the memo, I'll start with 600 West Holly. This is a property that's owned by the city. Uh, obviously the city would be willing to use this property for this narrow circumstance. It is on an old landfill and it is a Matka cleanup site. It is also located within a shoreline permit area that would of necessity by law, even in the case of an emergency, require us to go through the process for approval. Uh, that in and of itself would remove it from the ability to use this site. Likewise, we would expect that the construction of a facility, even a temporary facility, would be on the order of three to $4 million. Uh, one of the proposals that, is what, what, that we considered was a temporary tent. Uh, and the idea of a large tent structure uh, you can buy, you can purchase those relatively inexpensively, but the cost to install utilities and interior improvements, including fire protection, heating and ventilation, plumbing, uh, serviceability, communications, all add to the cost. So in total, our best guess was the cost of a facility at this location would be several months, including permitting, and several million dollars to install. Uh, similarly, we looked, at, we looked at locations on the Port of Bellingham, who was partnering with us on this investigation. We looked at two locations of similar characteristics, one towards the water along the F Street alignment, the other the old Lignan building in the waterfront area. Both of those sites have similar factors uh, uh, in terms of how it would take to, to construct a facility, uh, focusing mostly on a modular type building. We are still in that four to six, potentially eight months to construct a facility and have it up and operating at either of these sites. There is a fair degree of unknowns risk associated with these sites as we don't know everything associated with getting a facility built here. And so to factor that risk of the unknown, the costs go up. And as best as we're able to guess, the cost of building this type of facility to serve this, this need uh, would be in the four to $6 million range at either of those sites. Executive Sue talked about the county owned property uh, and we have very briefly looked at that site. He did a very good job explaining some of the constraints associated with that site. I would expect that we would have similar consideration in terms of time and money 
at the county owned property in that annex site as we would at the Lignan building, F Street or 600 West Holly location. And I think we could also apply those same criteria to other properties that might be identified, whether it's the civic field parking lot or city owned parking lots or other locations, the time involved to secure and, and develop that facility would be longer than the time frame that we have. Which leads us then to the 1530 Cornwall Avenue property. Uh, the cost to bring this facility up and running are significantly lower. And, and large part of that is uh, the risk of the unknowns is low. Tenant improvements are fairly straightforward. We know what we're getting into. We don't have the risk of, of uh, uncovering through an excavation an unknown facility. We do not need to install utilities. Water, sewer, power are already to the site. Communications are already at the site. There is very limited work we need to do to bring this up to speed, and we can get that work done within the next 30 days. Of importance knows that this site is the property owner has expressed support to use this facility. That is not always the case as we look at other private facilities at different locations. Oftentimes when we have reached out to the realtors or to the owners, they have declined to engage in the conversation because of the intended use. And credit to the owner for this location who has expressed support and is, is interested in supporting this for the period of time that we are talking about. All things considered, given the criteria that we're looking at and primarily time, as well as money, the 1530 Cornwall site, also known as the marketplace, best fits those criteria. Uh, and with that, I'll now turn it over to uh, Rick Sepler, who'll talk more about the permitting process. Thank you, Eric. Um, I'd like to address the permitting process and also some preliminary conditions that were included in Council's packet. As noted by previous speakers, um, we are acting under emergency authority. And emergency authority is only used when there is imminent risk to human life or property. Um, the bottom line is that folks may perish and we have an obligation to act immediately. In doing so, we were able to by bypass typical processes that are lengthy and can delay us having a, a needed response. Although we have prepared preliminary conditions, should council take action this evening, and these are proposed to address potential impacts that could be implemented concurrent with occupancy of the subject site. It is unknown how long the declared emergency will continue. It may be 18 to 24 months before a vaccine is developed and broadly distributed. However, when the emergency does end, the existing use, the use we're, we're proposing now, would be inconsistent with zoning. As such, we anticipate that the Lighthouse Mission Ministries would be applying for a temporary encampment in a building. That's a temporary permit that's permitted by our Municipal Code 2015 of the Bellingham Municipal Code. Consistent with the requirements of RCW 3521-915, cities cannot prohibit a religious organization from establishing a temporary encampment, either in a building or in other facilities, a tent or safe parking. Um, but cities can condition those applications to ensure that public health and safety are preserved and protected. And that's what we've used this process for. I should note that the city has experience and a very strong track record in administering this kind of permit. Um, we've had five temporary encampments that have been established, and in each case, we've developed a suite of conditions to protect both guests and surrounding residents and businesses. And we've learned through the experiences of operation, additional approaches that can be applied that might address some additional issues that might occur on a site-specific basis. Again, our, um, our list of conditions we've prepared and they're preliminary would go into play should the lease be approved and would be acting on the site until such time as we complete the temporary encampment permit. Then additional conditions or modified conditions would be fully implemented then. I have attached in your staff report a list of those conditions, um, and they are also to be provided when we notice the application for this project. The application that we anticipate receiving from the Lighthouse Mission Ministries is for four years to match the lease. The ministries provide, uh, Lighthouse Mission provides a code of conduct, 
um, which ensures that there is safety within their facilities and they're staffed 24 seven to address uh, the issues that occur on site. Um, we've done a few things that we haven't done before. We've asked for a full SEPTED crime prevention through environmental design assessment of the proposed public market site. And that is a, a way of using design and um, a thoughtful uh, interventions of technology to reduce the opportunities for crime to occur. And I know that uh, Chief David Dahl is watching and he can certainly ask questions, answer questions from you specific to that. Some of the outcomes of that are very key locations for on-site video surveillance, for lighting, um, and both the Lighthouse Mission Ministries as well as the city are committed to fully implement all of the recommendations contained through the SEPTED review. Additionally, we are proposing to require bi-weekly meetings whereupon the Bellingham Police Department, the Planning Department, the Lighthouse Mission, and business owners could come together to be adaptively responsive to issues that arise and do so in a manner that we can fine tune the strategies we're proposing and the ones will be identified through the public process. Some additional strategies that would be unique to the site is we've spoken with the uh, Lighthouse Mission and there'll be no distribution of food to those off site, not from this facility on the immediate periphery. Um, that was a concern that was raised. There's a litter issue. There's a issue of folks who don't use the facility but are kind of hanging out in the immediate area. Additionally, we'll be investigating and it's noted in the conditions, changing the parking on the immediate block face surrounding the facility to not allow for no overnight parking. That reduces the hangers on, who in many cases um, do not take advantage of the programs that are offered by the Lighthouse Mission, but may prey on some of the folks who are in those programs. Um, we are currently uh, in conversations with Lighthouse Mission, but potentially would consider another um, provider to provide area maintenance um, in the area immediately adjacent um, and in close proximity. And that would be in public spaces, as well as private spaces with permission. Um, that would be in the mornings, I would pick up litter, it would address inappropriate activities that occur that way. Um, I should note at this time, not all of those issues can really be attributed to the Lighthouse Mission. Um, however, um, we think it's appropriate to address those issues that are currently extant and any additional issues that might occur as a result of this location. To perfect the a temporary encampment permit will have a process. We anticipate an application being submitted should council take action tonight. Um, this week, we would likely look to do a notice of application, which would con contain our draft conditions. And we would issue that Friday this week to start a 14 day comment period. We view the comment period as key. We're interested in hearing concerns and solutions that we could implement. However, as mentioned, we can't condition the project away. We only can uh, find reasonable conditions that address public health and safety consistent with state law. Um, we anticipate holding an online informational meeting on the 24th, that's next Wednesday. We do that at five o'clock and we'll put all the information on how to participate in that in our notice of application. The process is that we have 30 days after, after we start our notice of application and find the application complete before we render a decision. And that decision is rendered by me. It's an administrative decision, which is appealable to the city's hearing examiner. That is a summary of the conditions, the process, and the distinction between moving um, into a facility using emergency powers or using a temporary encampment permit for those times when the emergency ends and the lease is still tolling. I'll turn this back over to the mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Suppler. At this time, I'm going to hand it over to the project lead for the city, uh, Tara Sundin. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm going to provide that overview of the proposal and the lease terms. Um, so the, the concept is the city will be the lessee, and then we will have the ability to sublease to the Lighthouse Mission. The property is um, over 75,000 square feet. So it's a pretty large piece of property um, with a 25,000 
square foot building. It's got a very large parking area that is going to provide for a large outdoor courtyard for guests, something that we really never had in Old Town, but that they do have at the high school that's been working well. Uh, the funding for this project is uh, the, the city would contribute $700,000 um, and both CARES Act and our local housing levy, the county $800,000 and they have a variety of sources predominantly focused on addressing homelessness. And then the mission, and I was misquoted in, in the Herald, but the, the mission would, is anticipating about a half million dollars per year to operate and probably more here because they're going to be taking on the, um, all of the costs of utilities and will be ramping up their staffing costs. So 1.5 million was um, in the, the Herald um, per year, but it's actually more like for three years and Hans can speak more to that. So the city and the county would be contributing towards lease payments uh, including a portion of the triple net and triple net is, is a part of um, costs that are incurred to the property owner like insurance, property taxes, uh, maintenance costs. And then we're also going to be contributing to improving this property. So this isn't quite as ready as the Bellingham High School was. It doesn't have a kitchen ready to go or showers ready to go. So we do need to make some improvements in the facility as well as purchase some um, furnishings for areas such as the, the courtyard. The lease terms, this property owner, um, I'm glad that, that the mayor and the county executive thanked the high school because I've worked with them personally throughout this and I'm very grateful um, to the high school. It hasn't, in my experience, been too frequently that people are willing um, to, to welcome um, this this use and I, I really appreciate them and I appreciate this property owner uh, who's been pretty open arms, but he has said that this is restricted to this use um, and that's because he is offering a rent that is below market rent. He is leasing this property at $6 per square foot per year. He has it uh, listed at 12 um, and so it's about $150,000 plus triple net. Um, but it, it is, has to be focused on this use. Um, the term is for three years with an option to renew for one term. And I wanna talk about why that is because I think that might be a little bit confusing. Why three years and why, why is it that there's that fourth year? Um, before COVID hit, the Lighthouse Missions Board decided, and you, the city council have been along this, many of you, um, along this kind of this path with the mission, it's been proven challenging to find a permanent location. Um, so the, the board said, you know what, we're going to use our own property. Yes, we have to get permits and approvals to do so, but we're going to use our own property in Old Town, something that we have control over. The challenge with that is that they are operating on their own property. So Hans, pre- this COVID and moving to the high school is saying to me, we're gonna need to look for a backup location while we're under construction. So as we come out of the high school and you know the isolation and quarantine facility and we start to, to look back at this, this moving from the high school, that is why we started looking for something that could serve this community, not during, not just during COVID, that's our immediate, immediate need, but also so that we don't have to move once again or find another spot while they're building in, in Old Town. And I will touch a little bit later on here on um, some conditions that we're gonna put on the Lighthouse Mission. We do have to provide the property owner with six months notice in order to renew for that fourth term. The property owner made it very clear to us that he was interested in a three-year term. He didn't want a really short term like a you know, few month kind of lease agreement, um, but that he was not interested in going any further than four years and that his intent is to do something else with the property in the future. Uh, you know, if you're familiar with the site, I know you all are, it's a pretty large parking lot. 
the property owner is requiring um, that we and um, hold the mission responsible for cleaning um, the parking lot and regularly cleaning it of litter and debris, um, making sure that none of the parking is going to be able to, to host overnight um, sleeping, so no camping or RV parking. This is a, a shelter inside the building, but not, not in the parking lot. I will note that we are planning to retain the parking area that's entitled restricted parking in the exhibit. There's a very large, it's, it's too much parking and it's too much space even for the courtyard. And so there's a parking area that goes from Cornwall Avenue to railroad that the city will retain. We won't sublease that portion out to the mission. And the reason for that is that we can provide um, provide the management and oversight and the enforcement of that. And we can, we can um, do permit parking there and ensure that only the people that that are meant to be there are there. Uh, you know that we've been granted um, the ability to do tenant improvements. So just a quick little summary of that is we do need to install some showers. Um, there, there are not any cooking food here, but need to be serving food here um, and some walls to segregate sleeping quarters uh, and from the, the main um, commons area, and then of course the outdoor courtyard. So with our sublease agreement, um, kind of the, I'm just gonna focus kind of on the key there because we're passing a lot of the main lease terms onto the Lighthouse Mission uh, with the exception of this one that's unique to them, which is this, this permanent facilities milestones. So we wanna make sure that when we move into or if we move into the public market, that the mission um, continues to work on its permanent plans. Because those of us that are familiar with these mixed use buildings, I mean, they wanna build something in Old Town, which is an urban village, which is designed for several stories. It takes a while to design something like that and permit it and build it about 18 months to construct something like this, but also they have a capital campaign. So we wanted to make sure that they were moving along that path as quickly as possible. So requirements to them are gonna be that within six months of execution of this lease, they need to apply for an interim housing permit, which is uh, the conditional use, conditional use permit process that um, is required of Old Town for a permanent facility. And then two years in, they need to um, demonstrate that there's a high likelihood that they are going to meet their campaign goals and they've started the land use process, not just the permit process for the, the um, use, but they've started design review. That means they're far enough along in the design of their building. And then finally, we need to see by two years and five months, because remember we have to give the property owner six months notice that they've started construction. And if they've started construction on something this, this um, of this magnitude, then we would enter into that fourth year. So that is why the three year and the four year come together. If we go into that fourth year, kind of in short, the, the mission is gonna be responsible for all costs associated with leasing the premises. Um, and so another motivation to, to have them um, taking action on a permanent solution as quickly as possible. And with that, I'll turn it back to the mayor. Thank you, Tara. And now uh, we're gonna finish the presentation with the executive director of the Lighthouse Missions, Hans Urschinger Davis. Thank you, good evening. Uh, I think you know it, but life on the streets is horrific. Our people experience a lifetime of pain and vulnerability. You're invisible, victimized, marginalized. People hide their kids from you and it hurts your heart. The last count showed 715 precious lives walking the streets of Whatcom County, mostly around the downtown core. 186 of those stayed last night at Bellingham High School. Another 100 stayed in our next stage recovery programs in Old Town. The uh, move of the drop-in center to the high school, 
I think was a huge win for our community. It allowed for social distancing. It kept 160 people out of the ER. We've had zero cases of COVID-19 so far. It's helped our people feel a part of society again by, by bumping up the showers from 100 to 400 a week. It's allowed our partners, our, uh, our community's medical, social, and spiritual supports to continue their good work. And it's given our people for the first time in a long time room to breathe. Prior to the high school, with our capacity constraints, we were turning away 15 or so a night, likely to go sleep in downtown doorways. And with the high school, we've seen that more space means more people getting more of what they need to stabilize and move ahead up and out of homelessness. The drop-in center is a 24-hour enhanced shelter experience designed to motivate and support people into next steps of life recovery. There's three meals a day, a cafe, a safe place to sleep, uh, restrooms, laundry facilities, showers, basic storage for overnight guests, uh, important documents and medication storage, mail services, a CMAR Community Health Center, space for telehealth meetings, space for strategic partners and mission case management, uh, community meeting spaces, emotional and spiritual support, and quarterly memorial services for people that die in the streets. It's Whatcom County's welcome mat for the marginalized, a home where you're welcome and wanted and we become friends. To keep this incredible project going and not turn 110 vulnerable people out to the streets of downtown Bellingham, we need a temporary space near the downtown core that can safely house them with social distancing and allow for that redevelopment of a permanent shelter on our existing property in Old Town. And we know we need to be good neighbors wherever we go. So we are committed to keeping the facility and the grounds an attractive part of the neighborhood. We're committed to training and outfitting staff and volunteers to do outreach to our unhoused friends, both in proximity and throughout downtown, to get them into our services. We're committed to giving businesses free coffee cards and info to encourage people to come into our, our base camp cafe. We're committed to giving the neighborhood a voice with educational webinars, compassionate interaction trainings, and a, a neighborhood advisory forum that hears concerns and troubleshoots issues. We are committed to harnessing our vast volunteer crews to help clean up back alleys of downtown. And we're committed to hiring a full-time downtown resource coordinator with a dedicated phone line to address individualized concerns. We do see businesses as our allies. We need them to provide internships. We need them to hire our people. We need their financial support. We need places for our 16 staff and 20 support staff to buy lunch. Our, our 50 volunteers a week and, and 15 strategic partner agencies need places to get their coffee. Our 8,000 donors need to know which businesses they can support. This is a, this is a cultural moment where we desperately need action from the entire community. We need a win for those that don't have a voice. The public market will be that win for Bellingham. This is something we can look back on after COVID-19 is over and say, look what we did for the least of these. I gotta say too that your city staff team has been incredible in working tirelessly on this project. So on behalf of 160 friends and neighbors of the drop-in center, we can't thank you all enough. So I say, please do vote yes on the public market. Mayor Fleetwood, I pass it on to you. Thank you so much, Hans. I'm going to pass it back to President Knutson at this time, who uh, will help moderate the public comment period. Okay, thank you very much, um, everybody. We will now go to the comment period. Uh, just to stress, it's three minutes. I know that doesn't sound like a lot, but we have 41 speakers, so we're going to be strict with the three minutes. Uh, Monet's going to say uh, 30 seconds, and then she's going to say time. And really, we're going to be strict with it because uh, we got to get through all these speakers. So, Monet, I'm going to turn it over to you, and you can list the first three speakers. Okay, the first three speakers are Lydia Bennett, Ken Reinschmidt, and Barry McCockiner. Go ahead, Lydia. Hi. Hi, Jean. 
uh, President uh, Knudsen, and hi, everyone else. Thank you for having me speak. Um, as most of you know, I have been a, um, working and I live in Bellingham. I've been working in Bellingham for all of my professional career. I'm a commercial real estate advisor, educator, and consultant, and have had a business, a small business in downtown Bellingham about a Oh, in various places in downtown. And I just love how downtown has been growing and thriving. Um, the big concern is, um, you know, the city's putting a lot of financial and um, other support into um, the Lighthouse Missions plans, which, is, which are great. However, what I'd like to talk about are the small businesses that may be impacted despite all of your efforts, which I, I might add are admirable. The plan is admirable. Um, but it might not work. And so what is <laughs> Plum Salon, I go to my hair, I go there to get my hair cut and she's been downtown ever since she opened the salon, which she opened when she was 18. She's barely 30 now. She has four kids. She supports those kids through her hard work, her blood, sweat and tears at building the business, which is half a block from where this uh, shelter will be. She has had to clean up and which maybe she won't now with the, the plan in place for um, the cleanup for crews, which is great. Um, what happens if people just don't feel comfortable coming downtown? And, you know, sound, the plan sounds great. That might not happen. But what if it does? What if it doesn't work? What are, what are the city, what are the plans to help her? Because she's the one that pays taxes to the city. She's the one that, that has um, eight other stylists that work with her that pay taxes. Um, that's the one thing that I think is lacking from this plan, which is here's what we are going to do for the businesses should things not work out as we planned. And I, I think that's a valid question. I don't want it to have to work out that way because it sounds great right now. But um, one thing that's missing is uh, support for the businesses that will be impacted. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing is uh, there should be an absolute guarantee that there, this will not be in um, downtown for longer than the lease term, that it cannot extend beyond four years, and that in case Lighthouse Mission cannot get funding. So thank you very much for listening. I appreciate it. I applaud all the efforts. I applaud the planning. I don't like the secrecy. I wish you would have brought us in sooner. That was really um, despicable. But on a good note, Thank you. Thank you, Lydia. Next speaker. Ken Reinschmidt. Go ahead, Ken. Hi, um, this is Ken Reinschmidt. I felt a duty to introduce myself. Um, you've all received a few emails from me. I share a lot of the concern that Lydia just mentioned. Um, in the beginning, you know, I was very, I, very interested in, you know, looking at alternate sites. Um, a little bit about me is I've spent um, the last 15 years working in a commercial real estate company. And I've done a lot of work downtown working with tenants and landlords and been a big advocate trying to get businesses to go locate into downtown and stay downtown. And, and I've seen a huge um, success in increasing the vibrancy of downtown for the last 15 years. It takes a long time, a lot of work has gone into that and it's taken um, uh, you know, a lot of effort with the city and, and, and businesses together. So there's a good, good history there. I'd like to see that continue. You guys, thank you for all your hard work. Obviously with the presentation tonight was very thorough and a lot of thought and work has gone into it. So thank you. I totally appreciate the difficulty of the decision. I share Lydia's voice in that um, I think the approach has been thorough with the exception of a lack of attention to the possible, the possible risk to our vibrant downtown. I would, it would take a long time to, to, to correct a course if we see suffer there. And I, I think you're underestimating what may happen. And I, I'd like to see some sort of more much more detail on what you can do to help businesses out with if, if and when they're experiencing a lack of, uh, you know, support for downtown and we're losing our vibrancy. Um, the plan has to be able to adapt to that. I, I feel we can put some budget and put some money into the plan for that. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next speaker. The next speaker is Barry McCockney. Go ahead, uh, Barry. 
Okay, I don't think he's here. Um, <laughs> the next speaker after that is Frank Schmelick. Mr. Good evening, Council and uh, City staff. Uh, this is a bit unusual for me because, as you know, I represent governments all over the state, and so I'm kind of on the other side of the table here. I'd like to thank all of you for wading through uh, about, I think about 11 emails I've sent uh, working as a member of the North Downtown Property and Business Owners uh, Working Group. What we really want is for the city council to delay this to June 24th, 2020, so we can consider alternatives. And I have three minutes, but I'll say a couple of things. I heard about the cost, that this is a cheaper alternative. And what is not measured here is the true cost, the cost to all of these small businesses downtown that have put their families and their lives and their treasury and their efforts into revitalizing downtown, many of them encouraged by this very government. I myself in 1994 was encouraged by then Mayor Tim Douglas to buy an old building and, and help revitalize downtown. And I don't think this is necessarily going to hurt me that much, but I don't want to sound too empathetic as a lawyer, but um, it will hurt people like the Adagio Cafe and like the, the, uh, uh, the, the local restaurant. Um, now, I appreciate the fact that, that the gentleman from Vancouver, Canada agreed to make his facility available for $12,533 a month when it is sitting vacant. Uh, but I will suggest two things to you. This is not an appropriate location. And it's not appropriate from the pers perspective of the homeless population that this is seeking to serve as well as the owners. Why the homeless population? Well, you are placing them in a position where you're asking them to leave this homeless facility and then be confronted by people who do not want them there and who are rightly concerned about them. These small business owners, somebody said they stand in the doorway and, and, and interfere with commerce. And so when people pick, when you, all of you decide, where are we gonna go to dinner tonight? We're gonna go to Barclay, we're gonna go to Fairhaven or, or we're gonna go downtown. And you say, you know, downtown, ah, it's kind of problematic. Let's go someplace else. These businesses have struggled. And I might add that my friends at the Adagio Cafe paid all of their employees when they had four customers a day through all of this. Now, there are alternate sites, 600 West Holly and, um, and also uh, the Courthouse Annex. Time is of the essence, but time is not the governor. You could easily put some tents on Civic Field, inside Civic Field, for a month or two. And let me just say that people have said to me, well, you can't house the homeless in tents. That would be un inhumane. You're at 30 seconds, just to let you know. I said that to my son, who's in the United States Army, who spent six months in a tent in the winter in Germany. And he can do it, and we can treat these people compassionately at Civic Field while we get a, a good solution. We have a contractor that's ready to build on either of these sites at cost. We have a supplier that's willing to supply things at cost. You'll end up with a tent. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, the next person is Christopher Renaud. Go ahead, Christopher. Christopher. Go ahead and read the next name, Monet. Mm, I see that he's here, but he's muted. Wait one second here. All right, the next name is Richard Davis. Go ahead, Richard. Also not here. Um, the next person is Hannah Cano, who we also don't see is here. And then the next person after that is Troy Molja. Go ahead, Troy. That person is also not here, sorry. Um, and then Ash Palta is the next person. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, oh, sir. This is Christopher, go for it. Okay. Thank you, sorry, I'm getting my, um, let me try to fit a six minute um, six minutes in the three. So my name is Chris Renaud. I live in Fairhaven with my two kids. I'm a lifelong resident 
born and raised in Bellingham and have lived here for 48 years through seven different mayors. I went to Larrabee, Fairhaven, Seahome, and Western. I have volunteered and supported many of the local organizations that support and help our community. I have a younger brother named Philip who needed to live at the mission on Holly Street for a while and now has been homeless in California for almost a decade. So I have a lot of personal experience with this issue. I often talk with the homeless camped in my parking lot, allowing them to stay out of the covered parking through rainstorms. I'm a professional engineer and run our 43 year old Bellingham family business, fiberglass structural engineering, newly located in the building across the street from the proposed shelter. That's about 30 feet. I purchased the building last year from the Mills family and the Hassel family with my life's savings. I have already started to fix it up, paved the back parking lot, some new roofs, and have plans for working on the front of the entire building. This block is home to a wide range of long-standing small family businesses and community supportive organizations that have served Bellingham for decades that represent all that is good and special about Bellingham. Planned Parenthood, FSE, Sunrise Services, who helps low-income residents navigate support services, Bellingham Fencing Academy, Gown and Glove, which is a secondhand store, Studio Galactica, City Barber, and Arliss's at Cornerstone in Bellingham and on our block. Since last week, when I heard of the secret and non-transparent plan by the mayor and city council to put the shelter in the public market building, I have felt helpless and betrayed by a city I grew up in a city I gave my entire life supporting, and a city that I felt, feel may be turning its back on some of its community. I have already had at least one tenant say they will now be looking for another location. The owners and tenants I have talked with feel the same way I do, betrayed by the city they love and unable to be heard on an issue that most affects them, their families, and their literal survival. We need to put the brakes on this process and take a step back and do it the old fashioned way, not the way that I would expect Trump to run a city. 30 seconds. I called, I called the mayor's office all last week and I couldn't meet with him. Um, my concern is if I lose tenants, I will lose my building. And so that's that's a, um, a threat to me personally. Um, Placing a low barrier homeless shelter in downtown business court is never a good idea. It's an imminent threat to my staff and my property. There are a lot of other locations to look at. Please consider those. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, the next person is Ash Palta. Go ahead, sir. Okay, Monet, go ahead. Next. The next person is Tom Pozariki. Pozariki, yes. Hey, good. <laughs> um, I'm the uh, regional president for Washington Federal Bank, which has its uh, regional headquarters next to the proposed facility. We're located at 1500 Cornwall. And uh, I just wanted to um, say I can see firsthand the adverse impact that these facilities can have on a downtown business community. My other office is in downtown Seattle. It's a city also challenged to address the needs of those experiencing homelessness. And despite our, our, our personal interest and professional interest to, to take care of those who are most needy, um, you know, I think the business community can be part of the solution here. And so I respectfully request that the council delay this decision um, on this location so the business community can present an alternative location. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, the next person is Austin Gardner. Go ahead, Austin. Okay, the next person after that is Logan Sitkin. Go ahead, Monet. The next person after that is Tracy Carpenter. Go ahead, Tracy. Well, when I meant three minutes, I didn't mean this fast. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, person after that is Amia Fruis. 
Hi there, it's Amy F. Rose, and I own Saratoga Commercial Real Estate. We represent several landowners and work with several tenants downtown Bellingham. And um, just wanted to, to echo a few comments. Um, I think that one of the challenges we're finding with several business owners and landlords is the, um, the lack of uh, time to consider this uh, potential use and garner our response. The, the concern primarily being to small business, uh, the impacts on small businesses, the impacts on property values for landlords who have adjacent businesses um, directly, and also just in the downtown core. Uh, during the COVID closures, we had received emails from the downtown partnership talking to, to business owners and landlords about the importance of keeping, keeping up the businesses and buildings downtown, it, despite the fact that there were less uh, customers and clients coming downtown. So really working to beautify the downtown core, making sure that, uh, that we were all being present and taking an effort. Saratoga's offices are located downtown by the bu downtown bus depot. And so the concern is how are the, the impacts on small businesses who may lose clients for landlords who may have loss in property value, who are going to be facing vacancies that perhaps, whether they're vacant now or maybe upcoming, as Chris Renaud mentioned, that tenants hearing of this use and considering other locations, uh, how will those landlords be, be compensated? And I think that needs to be addressed and would ask for a delay for more time to, to get answers to some of those questions. So a delay to June 24th for that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the next person is John Cruz. Go ahead, John. I would like to use my allotted time to address actions we would ask the council to take in the unfortunate event that they succumb to the public market side as being their only option. The immediate decision before the council is whether to approve the proposed lease. There are numerous issues that must be specifically addressed in that lease, as well as the associated sublease, which must be considered as part of the same action. Section 1.3 of the proposed lease allows the council until June 24th to accept or reject the lease terms. Therefore, approval of the lease should be delayed until there is time to assure that necessary clauses are included in both of those leases to protect the city, the downtown area, and the citizens who will be affected. We ask the council to ensure the following five issues at a minimum are addressed in the leases before voting for the primary leases approval. One, a clause that would prevent Lighthouse Mission or others from entering into a direct lease or purchase agreement on the property for use as a shelter beyond the current lease term. Two, a clause that would allow the city to impose future requirements or restrictions on Lighthouse Mission in response as future problems arise. Three, a clause requiring that all supplied food must be consumed within the shelter building. Four, a clause requiring that a daily early morning clean crew supplied by Lighthouse Mission or the city be sent through the surrounding neighborhood prior to business opening in order to mitigate the impacts on these businesses. And five, a clause requiring that the city and or the Lighthouse Mission provide a specific number of qualified staff to patrol the affected area of downtown seven days a week on at least a 16 hour daily schedule in order to provide safe and effective interventions with people from the shelter. I submit that the proposed sublease with Lighthouse Mission must be considered by the council to be a critical part of the primary lease. Therefore, it must be submitted to the council along with these necessary changes included before the council rules on the primary lease. In addition, there are actions we believe the council should require the city to take in order to fulfill their promise to mitigate the impacts. One, additional city budget items for cleanup and rebeautification of downtown areas most affected by the shelter. Two, annual property tax credits for owners who can demonstrate direct effects before the during the duration of his shelter location. Three, tenant improvement grants to attract attendance for properties that experience vacancies due to the shelter location. And four, tax forgiveness for businesses that can demonstrate additional expenses due to the shelter location. I've supplied council members with more detailed explanations on each of these items. As you can see, there's a lot that needs to be done before the council can in good conscience approve the proposed lease. Please make wise use of the June 24th timeline to require the establishment of specific protections and compensations for families who have invested their lives and savings in downtown Bellingham. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Okay, the next person is Janet Cruz.
Okay, go ahead. Okay, the next person is Amanda McCoy. You there, Amanda? All right, the next person is Kevin Buck. I'll keep going. Um, Charlotte Archer. And the person after that is Sherry Partlow. You there, Sherry? Hmm. Yes, I am. I was just uh, attending the meeting. I don't have a comment. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, the next person after that is Bernadette Holiday. Okay. All right, the next person after that is Angela Taylor. Okay. I see that they're here. Hmm. I'm muted, possibly. Uh, this is Angela Taylor. I don't have comments. I was just attending the meeting. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, the person after Wait, that. Is there any way we can tell if they're going to speak? We don't know. And when they sign up, they could be just sign up as a guest. Huh? Um, I mean, the webinar registration is for the purpose of the public comment period, but people get confused, rightly so. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, the next person is Denise Ire. Okay. Okay. Uh, the next person is Nicholas Van. Yes, hi. I just want to take the time to say thank you for the presentation tonight. Um, I do have a number of, of comments and uh, and that sort of thing, but I'll, I'll just submit them uh, in writing and uh, forego my uh, verbal comments at this point. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay. After that is William Eifert. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Good, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, I'm a long time, well, lifetime Bellingham resident and uh, I own the location directly kitty corner from the site. Uh, also involved with also other property ownerships and a big advocate of downtown Bellingham for many years and for our city for many years. Um, there's been a lot of really wonderful articulate and thoughtful comments and great efforts made tonight by all folks involved here, the city, the county, the Lighthouse Mission, we're grateful and uh, extremely lucky to have all these resources at our disposal. That being said, um, I think they're uh, just to kind of um, take a big picture look. This appears to me at this point to be a very rushed decision. Uh, needs to be thought through a little more further. I know we have folks that are in need, trust me, uh, with the, the downtown areas and businesses I'm involved with. I see it on at least a weekly, if not a daily basis. And uh, so do the many folks I work with. Um, we have spent over my lifetime, I'm, I'm 54 uh, years, resurrecting, supporting, trying to recreate and encourage a strong, healthy, happy downtown environment where people want to come daytime, nighttime, to be happy and comfortable with their families in restaurants, et cetera, in, in places where you want to feel safe on the street, in wonderful retail establishments, et cetera. And uh, this proposal, unfortunately, is, I think, a big torpedo in that direction. Uh, there are better locations. We need a little time to digest it. And I would hope that all those would take a real thoughtful look about um, a better way uh, down the road. And, you know, we can get through this short term. Sometimes change and stress and problems are great incentives for good things to happen. And I think that is what will happen here, but doing a quick rush job here and uh, doing a Band-Aid is not our answer. So thank you for listening to that. I've made some email comments as well. Uh, I uh, 
I'm sorry again for the lack of detail, but I just think a, maybe a longer, bigger, wider view is a thought. And I would encourage the council to very seriously consider that before they make any serious decisions on this lease. Thank you, Mr. Bird. Go ahead, Monet. Okay, our next person is Caroline Hamilton. Caroline, are you there? Okay. All right, the next person is Steve West. Thank you, Ms. Kirk. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, sure. I can. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to address the council. Uh, I am concerned because it's my understanding that there was an attempt made to push this plan through without any type of public hearing, without any type of information being provided to the business owners and the homeowners in Bellingham. I raises great concern because when you try to push something through without discussing it first and having a public forum where people can discuss their concerns is troubling. The fact that this was attempted without any community input under the guise of emergency declarations is problematic and does raise those concerns. Now, I'm just a common man. I'm a homeowner, I'm a voter, and I'm a taxpayer. I love what's going on in this community, especially in the downtown. I've got a question about the documents that everybody keeps referring to. Why wasn't those documents made available either online or you know, where we could go pick that up and review what the investigations revealed when it came to trying to determine places, the costs and concerns? I would like to see those. There's been a lot of effort into selling the citizens of Bellingham, the taxpayers, the property owners, the business owners on this plan a lot of great salesmanship has been placed into getting us to buy into this. But we got to think about the true cost to the small businesses, the small business owners, and the homeowners. You talk about cleaning and maintenance around the area. It sounds great, but why wasn't this done when we had the shelter or the Bellingham High School? That place was filthy day in, day out. I've seen people that lived in those communities out cleaning up. Not someone from Lighthouse, not someone from Bellingham High School. Citizens, homeowners going out and trying to keep their properties clean. So why should we believe that there's going to be a big change now because they moved two blocks to the south? 30 seconds. I'm also concerned as to why we should trust or believe that the Lighthouse is going to step up. I respectfully request that City Council delay this consideration and review the alternatives and to make the documents that you keep referring to from investigation and looking into this available for the citizens to review. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, the next person is Nancy Sheehy. Next. The next person is Tim, Tim Northrop. The next person after that is Gregory Grant. You there, Greg? Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Okay, first off, thanks to the council. Thanks to the staff. Thanks to the Lighthouse. It was a great presentation. I'm a lifelong member of this community. I've got over 32 years wrapped up in the real estate business. I own and manage properties, including some which will be affected by this decision. I love the Lighthouse Mission. I volunteered down there. They do a fantastic job. I'm asking you tonight to basically postpone the vote for a couple of weeks. I believe this is too serious of a decision for an emergency rush vote. This is gonna have a huge impact on downtown Bellingham businesses, neighboring families, and I think those that are affected by this need to be heard from. 
I, for one, as soon as I heard about this a week or so ago, I got on the phone and I talked to tenants. I talked to people that I know in the downtown business area, and they all pretty much said the same thing. They're worried. They're worried about what's going to happen when there's that many people at a drop-in center affecting their daily business. One tenant said, I've got enough problem with the downtown homeless people as it is. I don't need more. And people are going to stop driving to my establishment. Another person said, some of our tenants are not going to feel comfortable at dark in the wintertime going out to get in their cars. This went on and on and on. So I'm concerned. The proposal sounds great, but I don't think it's a good long-term decision. I don't think it's the right place for it. I wish I'd have heard about this a long time ago. I'm a little upset about that, but nonetheless, we got to solve this, but I don't believe this is the right location. And I think most of the people that are going to be affected by this need to be heard. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Greg. Okay, the next person is Marcus D. Stidham. Marcus. Hi, good to have, good, good to be here with you. Thank you for having me. Uh, Marcus D., I'm uh, the vice chair for Homes Now. And also uh, I sit as the, uh, on the Homeless Strategies Work Group as the homeless advocate there uh, as a county appointed, uh, council appointed position. Um, I, I, saying that about the, the Homeless Strategies Work Group, I would like to uh, really try to push for everyone to please let's reconvene the HSW, reconvene the Homeless Strategies Work Group. It's really important work. Everybody who's involved in homelessness in Washington County is in that group. And it's been largely shut down with only a couple of meetings since the COVID-19 crisis erupted. Uh, so I, I really want to ask everyone to please uh, make that a priority. <laughs> also, I, I do applaud the move to, to the public market location. I think that that, that location is one of the very best locations in Bellingham for that type of shelter. And I'm, I'm sorry to those business owners who uh, have been uh, living in that prime location for all this time and it finally has caught up with them in some way. I don't mean that to sound rude or anything. It's just a prime location. It's a great location and a good use. Uh, that's, that said, I, you know, and it's also nice to see uh, uh, some sheltering done in Bellingham that's not in the tsunami zone. That's, that's refreshing. But what are we gonna do about the winter? See what. I thought that was a really great location before when we had hundreds of people in the street and the drop-in center was functioning. But what about the 500 more people who are out there right now who aren't, who aren't getting those services at all? I'm really concerned about those people as winter comes on. That's the charge of the Homeless Strategies Work Group. That's what we do. So I'd like to, again, echo, we need to reconvene that work group immediately. <laughs> the parking lot and of, of the location, it'd be great if we could have a, a, a tent encampment or some safe parking there or something like that, uh, or somewhere else in the city. We need so many more other services. Again, what are we gonna do with the 500 more or more people who are on the streets this winter? Uh, we, we must uh, get busy with that. Um, <sighs> Homes Now is not a church, so we don't get to uh, stay in locations for a really long time. We don't get to just uh, put up a tent encampment or, or an encampment wherever we want and the, and the city gets to comply. We actually have to really work hard to make that happen. We're looking for an extension on permits that allow these encampments and we're asking your uh, consideration on that. We'd like to see five-year permit extension. For when, so when somebody puts in a tiny home village, they don't have to keep bouncing around. It doesn't have to be so mobile. There's no reason for that. Um, in the March HSW meeting, the Homeless Strategies Work Group meeting, uh, Health Department had and Deacon stressed how important it was for any campers who are camped out anywhere in, in the city of Bellingham to be left alone and, and so to shelter in place where they were, because that was they were considered to be the safest homeless individuals in in Bellingham at the time, and that's that's from Ann Deacon. Flo Simon of the police department echoed that they would comply with that. Thank you, Mark. That's not what we're doing though. We have sweeps, and we need them stopped immediately. Thank you, sir. Okay, the next person is Marilee Aliotti. You there, Marilee? Okay, go ahead. All right, the next person is Jeff Dybert. Okay. I see that Jeff is here. Okay, go ahead, Jeff.
Okay, he's not muted, but can't hear him. Um, the next person after that is Monica Lang. Hello. Sure, go ahead. All right. Um, so, you know, my name is Monica Lang. I own uh, Shake and Shine. It's one of the small d uh, businesses that are under discussion here. It's a dog washing and grooming um, salon, and I'm right on the corner of um, Champion and State. So I'm basically right at the back of the public market. Um, I've been there uh, for five years. Um, the majority, because I also have self-service as uh, walk-in customers. Um, I'm currently already impacted by, you know, what was described in the presentations as hangers on, because those are people um, that like to hang out um, around the bus depot and um, on the big parking lot opposite from that. Um, I have right now from customers talking to me that people are hesitant to come um, to this area um, because of um, this, these kinds of interactions. And I've had um, a, several um, customers getting accosted by usually intoxicated people. So I'm already impacted what is there right now. And um, from your presentation, um, it doesn't sound like there will be an alternative. It sounds like this is going to happen to me. Um, and I'm afraid that um, a similar situation like um, there's happening um, on Holly Street right now, that this is going to be created um, where we are. Um, the courtyard sounds a little bit alarming to me because of that. Um, I would like to know what kind of structural mitigation you're doing there to, you know, keep this looking pleasant. Um, I would like to have a lot more insurances about um, mitigation of impact on us. Um, I like what I heard about um, cleanup troops and um, um, people that we can contact at the mission. I've um, been in contact um, from time to time with the Opportunity Council Homeless um, Response Team, um, but they are very understaffed and they have limited hours. 30 seconds. Um, yeah, so... Um, Anyway, so I'm I'm very concerned about it, and I would like you to know this because I'm one of these businesses um, that are impacted. We just reopened um, in phase two, and so we really don't need um, another hurdle. And I really not I'm really troubled by the lack of transparency from your presentations. It's clear how much work you already put in there, but. Um, from the email responses I got last week when I approached the city council, it sounded like not even you knew about it yet. And um, that lack of transparency and public involvement is pretty troubling. Thank you. Go ahead, Monet. The next person is Larry Dybert. Okay, the next person after that is Joseph Jeffrey. Go ahead, Joseph. Am I unmuted? Yes. Okay. Um, so I uh, don't really have, you know, like much of a presentation ready. Um, I've been listening to y'all's presentations. It sounds like a lot of effort has been put into this, um, but I do agree with the last speaker. Uh, uh, a lot of effort might have been put into this, but not a lot of communication was put into this. Um, I'm uh, an owner of one of the businesses that will be right near there. Um, and personally, I don't have so much of a problem with the proximity issue. You know, Sat Paul brought up in the beginning how uh, some of the other proposed city-owned sites are, are actually uh, also very close. I don't have so much of a problem with proximity issue. I have a problem with the planning of this. Um, uh, considering that I actually looked at the public market property, um, I can tell you, I, I won't go too much into details, but I can tell you that the, the, the price that you're getting for it isn't really all that amazing, considering that that's, that's roughly close to the price that he was offering to other people as well. Um, 
he's looking for someone who just will pay the bills for a while. It's it's not like a really kind thing. And I, and I understand you need a place to go too. But if if this is supposed to be a really kind thing, then why can it not be a shorter term lease while something is actually being built? Why is the city money going into a long-term lease when the city could be putting money into simply building something more permanent, far more comfortable? I've been through that building. There are only two bathrooms. Right? There's a third one that's so tiny that it might as well be like a little like a, a, a phone closet. Um, there is no showers. It will be open dorm style living. Why not put the money into building something far nicer for folks to use as a drop-in shelter? Um, I, I will write down the rest of my comments because I have a lot of feelings and everything. But like I said, I, I don't, I don't, didn't have a lot of time to organize all of this because we're just finding out about this, which is very frustrating. Um, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for your presentations. But please consider moving the deadline back and figuring this out a little bit more structurally sound. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the next two people were Jen Mason and Chad Gale, but they're both not here. So okay. we're moving on to Peter Frazier. Hello all, can you hear me? Yes. All right, thank you. Uh, downtown property owners, Robert Hall and Ken Mann and myself, Peter Frazier, co-owner co of the Heliotrope Hotel and Hotel Leo, are in support of Lighthouse Mission's low barrier shelter on the 1500 block of Cornwall. None of us think it's an ideal location, but we understand that it must be sited somewhere and you found an acceptable location under the circumstances. This uh, support is conditional on the stated plan to build a permanent shelter at the Lighthouse Missions property at F and Holly within the lease term. As downtown Bellingham businesses recover from the economic downturn, due to COVID, it will be critical that we all work together to minimize impacts on business in the downtown. We request that every effort will be made um, by the city to do so, and the Lighthouse Mission for that matter. Uh, we understand how important it is to offer shelter and services to our neighbors experiencing homelessness and appreciate the city's efforts in this regard. We recognize that homelessness is a federal-sized problem that under current circumstances sadly must be dealt with at the municipal and county level in such a fashion. On an individual note, I have reached out to Hans, the executive director of Lighthouse Mission, and offered to help fundraise for the effort to build a permanent home for this facility at F and Holly. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Okay, the next person is Eva Grace. Okay. I see that Eva's here. Maybe a second to unmute themselves. Okay, um, the next person is Douglas Gustafson. Hey, can you guys hear me? Hey, Doug. Hey, how's it going? Um, I just wanted to say uh, I'm Doug uh, Gustafson. I am um, chairman of Homes Now, Not Later. We operate um, Unity Village, a tiny home community in Fairhaven. Um, we help, right now we help 17 people who were homeless and um, are no longer homeless because we're providing emergency housing. Um, we, I, what I would say about this about this um, situation is, I, I'm not really against the the um, uh, location. I, I I don't, you know, I think it could work at any location. I think the the main thing we have to be aware of, and the thing we should really put pressure on is the idea that the management of such a facility has to be very um, up, up, upright and actually treat, treating everyone with respect and making sure that as much as possible, uh, there's no issues in the surrounding area. Um, uh, Unity Village during COVID has been doing very well. Uh, we are hoping to open up more villages. We we don't we d we think that this is a good idea for the city to pursue you know increased capacity for this. We think with COVID and the economy getting messed up, that um, you, you're going to need more solutions. At the same time, we're willing to set up more villages. Uh, we we need land, uh, and we 
it's self-sustaining. So we don't actually need a lot of money. We don't have paid staff. So uh, we, we are offering a, a, an alternative solution at the same time as this solution is going forward. So um, we would advise the city um, and the county and whoever to work with us. And, you know, um, we can set something up and, and make a dent in this problem. And we're not the solution to every problem, uh, but we can help. Um, in a different area and it takes pressure off the mission. It takes pressure off of uh, existing services if uh, people are stabilized and uh, just want to let you know we're doing really great and uh, we hope we can do more and we're eager to do more. We, we won't take taxpayer dollars. We, uh, we don't actually uh, take government money, uh, but we're always cool to work with the government and get something done to house people in an affordable way and so I, I know that this is kind of a ramble, but uh, I just hope that the city and the county will consider this and uh, we're doing great. We hope we can do more and we support the mission and doing and being being able to handle more capacity than they were able to. Thanks, Doug. OK, the next person is Grayson Williamson, but they are not here. So we're going to move on to Bruce Graniewski. Uh, no comment. Just. Just watching. Thank you very much. Okay, the next person is Dustin McKisson. We have a large viewing audience. <laughs> the next person after that is Jessica Valentine. Hi there. Um, I'm not a business owner, I am just a uh, resident of Bellingham and um, I live on Irving Street right by the high school so I can speak to um, uh, to everybody about their concerns as far as impact um, and I can sympathize with the business owners that are currently facing um, the same thing because we uh, just like you had no idea really that this was happening um, until it was already happening and um, again I want to just echo what the gentleman said um, before me about just the fact that it's more about the way I think that these uh, facilities are run and managed. Um, we have had a ton of vandalism. Um, we've had the, the police have had to have been called um, for numerous instances, people screaming. Um, it's just nobody is really doing the thing that they said they were going to do with patrols. Um, I know when the high school is functioning, I've lived here for 11 years, the principal themselves will actually come out to the neighborhood and walk around to make sure that kids are not loitering. And um, that's fairly effective, but we haven't really seen anything like that. Um, and it has, it has made um, an impact. Absolutely. Um, our neighbors, we are kind of a arterial route here and, um, None of our neighbors want to stand outside and talk at night because it's just things don't really feel safe. There's a lot of um, people out here with um, obvious drug problems or alcohol problems um, and mental problems. And I do believe that they need a place and I'm all for helping to, uh, to find that location. I don't know if the marketplace is the right place. I just wanted to speak to somebody who is and has been seeing a direct impact on um, just this location change. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Okay, the next two people are Jody Joyce and Gina Eiford, but they are both not here. And then the person after that is Garrett O'Brien. Go ahead, Garrett. Okay, Monet, go ahead. Okay, the next person is Claire Thurman Moore. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, I, I wasn't planning on speaking tonight, so I don't have anything formal prepared, but I'm a psychiatric nurse practitioner here in the community. And I work with many of the folks who frequent the drop-in center on Holly Street and now the Bellingham High School. And I was really thrilled to read in the paper that the drop-in center was gonna move to the public market, um, knowing that uh, 
the unsheltered in our community will have a space where they can uh, find some degree of respite um, and that allows for physical distancing. Um, you know, any, I think any break in, in the services that the drop-in center provides would be really devastating to our community. Um, and I, I can only imagine how overrun our emergency room would become and how overtaxed our mental health system would be if we didn't have um, those services, even for a brief period of time. Um, I think the truth is that there's no, there's no good location because um, homelessness and mental illness and addiction are problems that none of us really want to face or are, are able to, to face um, in a, in a way that feels immediately productive. Um, there's no easy solutions. And, and my sense is that the city recognizes that. And, and I just really appreciate how much work you all have put into, um, to caring for this community that really needs care. Um, even as, uh, their presence is disruptive, um, to, to our community um, because, but the truth is that they are, they are part of our community. Um, so th thank you. Um, and I, I do hope that, that the downtown business community and Lighthouse Mission can make this work. Thank you very much. Okay, the next person is Melora Christensen. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Um, thank you, uh, City Council, um, for taking this on tonight. Uh, my name is Melora Christensen, and I'm speaking um, as a community member. Um, my wife and I have lived in Bellingham for the past 15 years, and I've worked as a social worker um, with the unsheltered community for the past eight years. Um, as I listen to the comments tonight, um, I'm struck by how powerful it would be if we were asking how we could welcome this community and open our doors and businesses coming to the table and saying, this feels uncomfortable, but, but how do we do this? And how do we not shy away from how difficult this is? The reality is, is that the people that do not have shelter are our neighbors and they're our community and they deserve dignity and respect and they deserve to be welcomed, whether that be in Fairhaven or Barkley Village or Linden or downtown. And I am someone who spends a lot of time downtown and I spend most of my money there and I deeply respect our business owners. But I would love to see us standing up to flip the script and to have the courage to embrace this community and to not say it's too hard. You know, it's too hard, so therefore we, we would like it to go somewhere else. You know, nimbyism, not in my backyard, is a phrase that's used because every time we have talked about the right spot for folks to have the space and, and the dignity that they need, it's, it's always not in this neighborhood. Some, it should be in another neighborhood. And I just really want to challenge our community to say, we can do better. We can, we can value and welcome this community. And if we did that, how different this conversation might be. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, our next person to speak is the person with the phone number ending in 718. Agent 718, are you there? Okay. Go ahead, Monique. It sounded like someone was there. Oh, okay, I see a phone. Go ahead.
I can see a phone on the screen, but. Yes, go ahead. Oh, sorry about that. Well, maybe they'll come back. Go ahead, Mona. Okay. Um, the next person is Terry Bryant. Okay. Um, Logan Sipkin, if you wanted to chime back in, we see that you're here with us again. I'm just here to listen. Okay, okay. thanks. Um, and Janet Cruz, go ahead if you'd like. Hi. Hi. I'm, I'm Janet. And um, I've been listening to everybody's comments. And as everybody can see, nobody's opposed to helping the homeless. And anybody that's spoken here tonight, people want to help the homeless. But you talk about giving dignity to people and you want to put them in a grocery store. You know, how about thinking about some of the other sites that are available? I sent uh, an extended site to the council and the mayor of a property owned by the Port of Bellingham out on Williamson Way that was a former training center. And I, I don't know if it was like National Guard, but it's set up with meeting rooms, showers, restrooms, huge grass area surrounded by trees, and it won't impact anyone around the neighborhood. It's $1 per square foot. Now, how come we can't think of places like that that will be not only have all the facilities you need, but also an environment that has greenery and grass and a healing environment for these people? Um, Everybody says it's too far away. It needs to be close to the Lighthouse Mission. Well, you're talking about staffing the downtown mission at this public marketplace. Why can't you staff that kind of place? Um, I just think we're just thinking too tight. We need to open our periphery and work together on this because we all want everybody to have a place to live but we also want to have a thriving business. So I really think we should listen to the gal that lived by Bellingham High School to realize as naive as y'all seem, there will be a huge impact to downtown. So let's find a better place for the homeless to have a chance to actually have a nice life instead of putting them in an old grocery store. So I would like to say, please postpone your vote so you can listen to more ideas and probably better ideas than what you've come up with. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, I see that Terry Bryant is back. Would you like to speak? Yes, are you able to hear me? Yeah. There's a lot of feedback though. Go ahead. Um, thank you. Uh, my name's Terry Bryant. I'm speaking as a community member. Although I do work at the Homeless Service Center at Opportunity Council. I've also owned a small business downtown from 2012, um, from 2002 to 2012, and I own a small business right now that's directly alongside Bellingham High School on Franklin Street. And the reason I became interested in working with homeless services is that over time, I came to realize how many of my customers were homeless. Our homeless neighbors are spending their dollars in our small businesses too. Um, and I would like to say that we've noticed a minimal impact in our business location on Franklin Street as a result of being right next door to the current drop-in center. And so I uh, just want to express my support for this relocation site. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, um, we see that Bermadette Holiday came back. Would you like to speak? If not, that's it for me. That's it for you. Thank you very much, Monet. Okay, before, um, well, I'm, I'm going to turn it back to council now for questions, and then I'm sure the staff will want to respond to some of this. Uh, Mr. Lo you, hey, you guys can go ahead and use your hands on the screen. Go ahead, Michael. My screen's back, so you can use the raise the hands if you want. Go ahead, sir. Thank you, Gene. Um, I would like the staff to address uh, two related points. They all have to do with timing. Um, 
significant number of members of the community feel like this uh, came on them suddenly um, and there wasn't notification, it would be nice if staff explained basically how the process goes that this thing came forward as fast as it usually comes forward in a sense and we were notified as soon as we're usually notified and, and this is the public process. So I'd like some discussion on the process that led up to this. And then also there's been many requests for a delay till June 24th. I'd like to understand whether that's possible, what impact that would be, um, because we are under a, a tight schedule to move out of the current location and there are permits to be processed. Who's going to take that? You, sir? I, I, I can take the second question. Go ahead. Second question is about the delay in timing. And I want to communicate that there are improvements we need to make inside that building to have it ready to be service to serve the needs that the mission has identified in the way that they need to identify it. Included in those improvements are the addition of showers, some restrooms, laundry facilities, uh, separation within the space to accommodate the appropriate social distancing. Uh, we have been working with a contractor to develop that scope of work over the last week. People have seen that contractor in that facility doing the, the, the basic planning and prep work for that work to start. We have a schedule that has them starting as soon as we're able to execute an agreement. If, if the council so chooses, we're not going to make that presumption. And if all goes as scheduled and as planned, they would be done with their work the evening of July 15th. So a delay to the 24th would cause a disruption in that schedule and would likely push this back probably a week or so at least, which then has a ripple effect to the high school on their ability to prepare for teachers and administrators and students to return to their effect. So can, the, can we wait a week? Yes, that will have an effect to the schedule, which will have ripple effects further on down the line. So our, our schedule to have the facility up and running is 30 days. It's about the 15th, the 16th of July, June today, 30 days gets us to July 15th. Okay, uh, Terry, you wanna take the first question? I think the mayor was planning on taking the first question. Go ahead, Seth. Yeah, I'm happy to respond to the, the concerns that have been raised about um, the quote, lack of communication uh, to the public on this issue, the issues that we've heard about uh, this being negotiated um, in secrecy. Uh, I think it's important to remember that this was all undertaken with a sense of great urgency. Uh, we recognize the reality of this situation we're in. I think in the, the month of February, we all felt the, this impending crisis looming. I believe it was February 29th that the governor issued his um, emergency proclamation. It was uh, March 12th that um, I proclaimed an emergency. We were all uh, thinking about the reality that the drop-in center was going to be something that had to be moved um, and we were able to move it to Bellingham High School on a very quick turnaround um, and we were able to do that because of my exercise of uh, utilizing the emergency proclamation. Uh, March 20th of course the move to Bellingham High School occurred. Time uh, you'll recall the the crisis was um, in full motion at that time. That was the period of time when we were seeing the spikes. Uh, April came and we were all fortunate that uh, Bellingham High School was put online as quickly as it was. And though some concerns have been expressed about Bellingham High School, there were many, many people who actually managed at the site, oversaw the site, and have commented, Hans made reference to it, about the, the benefit of people being able to spread out, the fact that it had a calming influence uh, with many of the people who, who were residing there. Um, by early May, it was readily on uh, our radar screen that time was passing and that we had the summer um, 
time frame to get out of Bellingham High School. That was all contractual. We knew it all along. The Bellingham School District, as I indicated, um, has have given us a firm date of July 15th. They think that will give them sufficient time to prepare the school. Uh, so uh, there was there was analysis done in um, the month of May, in the first half of May. There were a number of sites that were mentioned, some of which were on port property. There was analysis being done on the viability and the efficacy of those sites. Uh, and the public market was flagged as a site that uh, met the time urgency issues and the, the cost issues. But <clears throat> importantly, uh, it wasn't until later in May when real earnest um, engagement began with the landowner. People recognize that we don't, and state law doesn't require it, it's not regarded as a best practice to negotiate contract in public, and we're not required to do so. This urgency required us to do site selection, it required us to do negotiation, and steps towards implementation all at the same time. So when we moved forward to only a, a week ago, uh, it's been said in some publication that uh, council didn't uh, know about this. I contacted council members over the weekend of June 7th. And again, that was only a week ago. And I did tell them that um, the essential terms of um, a possible agreement were not ripe for public distribution because we didn't even have, that's just how urgent this was. We didn't even have um, an agreement in principle at that time. So I simply indicated that we're actively working on this effort and shortly thereafter we would be ready and we did in fact notify it. It was only three days later that we publicly um, made that known. So I just wanna emphasize, and here we are one week later considering it. Um, this view or the suggestion that this has been a secretive process that has been emerging for a lengthy period of time is just not fair or accurate. And I just want to underscore the what I said initially, site selection, negotiation, and implementation are all happening at the same time. So that's why we're in this situation um, that we're in. Uh, I, I feel for the people who are frustrated by this. Um, and we're going to do everything that we can to mitigate the, the impacts as best we can. We're going to unveil the uh, downtown Bellingham assistance team to, to help with local businesses to the best extent that we can. We're going to uh, unveil right-of-way plans for opening up uh, streets potentially so that we're ripe for uh, summer activi activity and commerce. We're going to communicate and message the fact that we've done the best we can for downtown for summertime to get through the summer as best we can. I think there's just a lot of positivity that we can see uh, in these efforts. And I, I hope that we're able to satisfactorily mitigate um, many of the current con legitimate concerns that have been expressed by people. But I do want to uh, just address this view or suggestion that this has been a lengthy period of secrecy. It's been under very difficult circumstances. We've done the very best that we can to make this necessary move happen. So thank you for letting me make that comment. Thank you, sir. Mr. Hamill. Thank you, Mr. President. I, I wanted to address the delay question, delay to, to June 24th uh, in hopes that some other sites would make themselves apparent. I served on the homeless strategies work group uh, back in uh, late 2016 and into 2017 that identified a host of different uh, sites throughout Bellingham. These were well vetted uh, sites before they came before us. Um, we looked at every site, deliberated, uh, deliberated rather, over each site and uh, came to the conclusion that unfortunately none of those sites would work. So the the suggestion that somehow if we if we delayed and then we could go back and maybe think about 
those sites again. They didn't work then, and they don't work now. We have a viable uh, option here with 1530 Cornwall. Um, I think with the proper mitigation efforts, uh, it really does come down to operations and how um, how well the mission will do when it comes to um, listening to and, and responding to any issues that are um, had with the surrounding businesses. But I do want to make sure that folks know that back in, in the course of uh, over the course of about a couple of years, starting in late 16 into uh, 17, we did look at all those sites and were deemed non-viable. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Pinky and then Lisa. Thank you, Council President. Um, you know, this is such a complex and heart-wrenching challenge to balance the needs of our most needy and our business community. And citing a new drop-in center has always been a controversial subject, which requires a lot of patience and a lot of compassion. I spent a lot of time the last week talking to people who have businesses downtown with our chamber, with our downtown um, business. And uh, I want to acknowledge the business community's concerns. And I'm acutely aware that the economic recovery is going to be a really big lift after COVID. I spent the last few weeks working on business advisory committee for our CARES Act fund to distribute funds to our local businesses. I do not want to cause any more obstacles to our recovery and ensure we are making the choices that will lead to a rebooted economy and a strong downtown. So I am looking through this economic and humanity lens and we need a solution for our, hum for our homeless community. We started, the city of Bellingham started this in 2015. And then two years later in 2017, the county and the port came onto the conversation. That's almost five years. There has always been different proposals. Well, you should go over there, not in my neighborhood. And none of them are ever going to be perfect. Can we do better? Yes, we can. If we all work together, we can do a little better this time around. And one thing I want to address is this shelter is not going to bring more people downtown. People uh, think that moving the homeless population to the county or where you can't see them is going to keep people from coming downtown. Cities across America, every study that you look at, homeless shelters need to be downtown because that's where people congregate and that's where the services are. So therefore, we need a location downtown. This location has way more benefits than it does drawbacks. Firstly, it already exists and we're not building something new or bringing in utilities. It's the most cost efficient option and budgets are gonna be pretty tight coming forward. It has access to transportation, the library, and it's surrounded by the partner services that the homeless population uses. We are facing unprecedented times in COVID and social unrest with Black Lives Matter and defund the police. And we must bring all these factors into this conversation. I think we do need to look at how we interact with our homeless community and we have an opportunity for improvement. We can do better and we need to have a broader conversation on how to use our resources effectively. And I think the city has done a great job in looking at the contract with, LM, with Lighthouse Mission to ensure that we are gonna do this um, in a way that is cohesive for our whole community. We need to ensure the business community needs are met and this location does better at supporting the neighborhood. You know, last year I visited some shelters in San Francisco that were right downtown. They're highly acclaimed across the country because they do a great job. They're right downtown, but you wouldn't even know it because they're disguised by bright, beautiful, colorful fences. They're clean, they have gardens inside, opportunities for sociability. And they had a three P philosophy, people, pets, and possessions. People, regardless of religion, gender, or relationships, everyone was welcome and could stay together. And you could bring your pets and possessions, which I know has been a barrier for some. They had a huge art station for the guests to create and display their art on the walls. And it was truly what is considered low barrier. So I, I think this is the best options that we have currently. And I see a vision of this new location being a warm, welcoming place that the whole community can contribute to with picnic benches and plants and art supplies. 
And I want to ensure that we honor the safety and the cleanliness measures the businesses have asked for, and we all pitch in to help those in need. We can take this opportunity to do something right for our homeless community and our business center, and I ask us to work together to be successful. We all need to make some concessions to be part of the solution. I want to thank everyone who sent in all the letters of support and reached out, and I just want to ask us to work together and make this location happen and great for our community. Thank you. Thank you. Lisa. Thank you, President Knudsen. Um, we have received a lot of communication over the last week for um, support and then also people voicing concerns and even the people supporting, I mean, voicing the concerns, they also want to support uh, people who are um, unsheltered. But in listening to um, the people who have concern, I think, again, good management on site management is gonna be essential. Um, making sure that there's that buffer and ensuring that things are clean. Um, but also, I think it's a little bit of that fear of unknown that when the shelter, if it should be opened at this location, um, what guarantees do we have that um, it will be there for four years and then a permanent shelter in this timeline will be built. Um, a gentleman brought up a, a, a good question that I would like the city to answer. And there may not be an answer because it's hard to predict the future, let alone um, autonomy of uh, nonprofits to be able to pursue um, opportunities in the future. But the, the question being, um, what you know, basically what prevents the Lighthouse Mission from purchasing this site and siting it um, permanently there, um, if that has been discussed. Um, and if there's, uh, I don't necessarily want to say that we have to have a clause in the contract, but um, I also am concerned financially that if we do hit a recession, um, the ability for the Lighthouse Mission to raise the essential funds to build. Um, I also, if this should be cited here, I really hope regardless of the economy, that the businesses and um, individuals that we do everything we can to support the fundraising efforts to ensure that a permanent location can be built. Um, I do wanna make two other comments. Um, hopefully that question could be answered, but um, the two comments is we as a community really have um, for the longest time been looking for uh, an opportunity or an alternative um, to be able to site a location for um, low barrier for our, uh, our population. Uh, we have done changes to our, uh, our city codes that allow small um, shelters to be uh, nested in single family neighborhoods to try to create those opportunities for um, site locations for you know, five to 15, even up to 40, um, depending on the um, designation of the land use, but we're not there yet. That just recently happened. Um, I think large shelters, it would be wonderful if we could have multiple large, multiple smaller shelters that are more community-based, but again, we're not there yet. Uh, we have basically 30 days um, to ensure that uh, our neighbors are not just turned out to the streets, because if that happens, um, I think with the pandemic, we're going to have severe issues um, not just for uh, our neighbors who are unsheltered, but the community at large. Um, if people are worried about folks being downtown, I'm more worried about not having a shelter for these people, um, our neighbors to be able to be housed. Um, and then also I just, a quick comment. Um, I understand this is moving fast. It's moving fast for council too. Um, we just had, you know, 300 pages to read through a public comment and the contract. Um, this, I don't feel was done in secrecy. Um, information has to be pulled together. Uh, the city I think has done a wonderful job looking at multiple opportunities um, and locations and vetting them out to see if they're cost effective or possible. I, I don't think one site was picked and it was kept secret. I think the city did their due process in trying to find something. And then it's brought before the public and council. 
Um, the gentleman who felt that the documents are, aren't available, just public uh, information. If you go to the Bellingham uh, City webpage and you look at city council meetings, the entire packet and information that is being presented is available there. And it was made available there before this meeting. So if someone feels that they want to have more information, please remember to go, especially if you know there's going to be a meeting, go to the city council um, webpage and take a look at the meetings. The information is going to be available for you to review. Um, but I'll turn it back because um, if there is any information that could be shared regarding the possibility of this becoming a more permanent location um, for the Lighthouse Mission, um, that would be useful to share. Or um, if you have information where this would not be possible or would not happen, I think that would also be um, good to share for the people who have um, requested this delay. Thank who you. wants to answer that one? Thanks, Lisa. Peter, Hans, anybody want to answer that? Go ahead, Peter. Yeah, Peter Rafato, uh, City Attorney's Office. So um, from a legal perspective, I just want to point to what you already know, just to start with the basics, what is in the lease. So the maximum duration of the lease is four years. To extend that, it would require council action. So that is the extent of the city's leasehold interest. Now you get to the question of, well, could something be built into the sublease or the lease that would limit the land use beyond the city's interest? The problem there is that you're reaching, trying to reach beyond the city's proprietary interest, reaching beyond its legal interest on that property and doing what is really a land use control. And for that reason, in my opinion, it would be an overreach. That's especially given that under the statute that uh, Mr. Sepler referenced, this, um, this type of use is a protected use under state law. And so that's a, sort of a legalistic answer, but that, um, that's how I see it from, from that perspective. Okay, any other questions? Michael? Yeah, Gene, I want to ask a few questions, um, but I, I want to comment on, on some of what's been said before. Um, as Pinky indicated, we have been looking for location for shelter for years. This, and, and usually um, public locations that we own, like the courthouse property, it, it's got problems of its own, and no private property owner has ever been willing to lease their property for a homeless shelter before. We've asked, none. Um, so it's kind of remarkable uh, that we're, we're getting um, this right now. If it weren't for the coronavirus, um, I would be doing what I started to do last year, and actually in January and February, is pushing for a second shelter location. We have unmet needs for people who are elderly or disabled or medically fragile, who are thrown into basically the all-purpose shelter and they're not being adequately served. We need more shelter services and citing those populations was just as much of a challenge as citing this population. So that's not a new challenge and if there was another location that I thought would work, that I thought we could afford, I'd vote for it. Um, I haven't heard a, a viable one that isn't too far away, too expensive, too encumbered with shoreline issues or what have you. Um, um, I, as, as Mr. Hamill said, um, operations is everything. Um, we know there's been some spillover effects at the Old Town location from the original drop-in center. That was an improvised use. Uh, thank you, Lighthouse Mission, for stepping up. But it was improvised use, and there were spillover effects, and they weren't good. Uh, there appear to be some spillover effects from the current location. We need to get better about that. We need to step up. We need to, in the sublease, and I think we have it in there, and maybe strengthen that language. We need to make sure Lighthouse Mission is doing more than they have done in the past. And then also the city, we need to do more than we have in the past because now this is partially our choice, our responsibility. So we need to address those impacts. They are legitimate. Uh, operations really is everything. Um, my questions have to do about what if 
uh, the Lighthouse mission can't perform? What if their capital campaign falls short or their campaign runs late? What if the extra four-year extension isn't reasonable because they're not about to begin construction? Um, I'm worried about that possibility. Um, I don't know what we can do to protect ourselves from that, frankly. Um, that's out of our hands, but I want to consider the, the risk that we are getting into by uh, trusting that our community will step up, that the fundraising campaign will be successful, and that the Lighthouse Mission can fulfill that. I'm also worried about the Lighthouse Mission doesn't handle the spillover effects. What hammer do we have? I don't want to take a hammer to the mission, for goodness sakes, but what hammer do we have if they aren't stepping up or if their best efforts aren't good enough? Um, because these effects are genuine and they're partially our responsibility, but also the Lighthouse missions. How can we hold them accountable? Um, I know they have the best intentions, but what if? So I'm, I'm hoping someone can answer some questions about the what if scenarios, if their capital campaign fails, if they run late, and if their spillover effects aren't properly handled, who's left holding that bag and who suffers? Who wants to take that one? I'll start with part of it. I think okay. Rick, I'll have Rick start preparing for the hammer part. And I will also ask that Hans probably chime in here about capital campaign. Um, I think that's a fair observation, Michael. And I do want to say that just because the mission wants to build an old town, they have not started that process. So I don't want any of you to think that um, the site is, that's the site. So they have not started that process. Um, I know that they have done some fundraising. I know that they're starting a fundraising campaign. What I've said to Hans at, the, at a point in time, the, I think, uh, county executive talked about the the best getting in the way of good or whatever that phrase is, but there may have to be a point in time where we as a community or the mission say, you know what, we can't afford to build a five-story building with all the bells and whistles. Hans and I have talked about it. We might have to just focus on the drop-in center and do a two-story building or a three-story building. Um, the other option would be, um, we could be in a situation where we're looking for another site, another solution. Um, and I, I guess I would also say that, um, you know, just that smaller option could be the case. So the community is going to have to step up and I think through a capital campaign show that this is something that this community wants to support. If they do, I think that we can pull it off in the time frame. Hans, do you want to add to that piece before we turn it to Rick? Sure, I'll speak to that a little bit. So when it comes to capital campaigns of this nature, typically there's, well, one, we've done some pre-feasibility uh, to see if the, the folks with high affinity uh, and high capacity can afford to build this sort of project in our community. And it typically takes around 30 people uh, to raise about 95% of the cost of it. And the other 5% gets filled in by, by folks in the community. And so it's a very careful sort of uh, major donor cultivation uh, that allows this sort of project to come to fruition. Uh, the time frame that we have to do it uh, is, is somewhat tight uh, in terms of a couple of years, but you can, but it's also, Quite feasible. One concern that we did have was, uh, is COVID-19 going to impact uh, that fundraising effort? Should we pursue it uh, in light of this? And uh, our research shows that it actually, uh, this is actually the prime time to do it. And of those 30 major donors that help support this effort, uh, the COVID-19 hasn't impacted them uh, the same way as it has other folks. So we're, we're uh, feeling very positive. Uh, I know we've raised nearly a million bucks already without even um, releasing the fact that we're doing this. Um, and uh, that's going to help with a lot of the early costs uh, getting this project off the ground. But it's a, uh, we're, we're feeling, like I said, very hopeful. Um, yeah, and, I, and, and also to speak to some of the concerns I heard about, about, you know, we're going to stay there. Our intent is not to stay uh, at that site. Uh, at the public market. Our, our aim is to get a, a larger, better facility uh, that has 
a lot of space, a lot of different entrances for smaller shelters uh, within one building that meet the specialized needs of, of people like seniors or medically fragile folks or workers or these different types of groups that do well together but maybe not mixed in with everybody else. So that is our aim and uh, uh, of course a lot can happen in three years but that is uh, the trajectory that we see ourselves on. Okay, Rick, go ahead. I'll follow up on that. I think um, the key is to establish those milestones where actions change. And what I mean by that is by date defined in the sub uh, the sublease, if um, financing has been secured and plans are not filed and construction is not poised to occur, we need to have adequate time to develop an alternative approach on where to go. So we're not faced with the urgent rush we have to deal with things. And let me speak for a moment on that urgent rush. Folks, 1,200 people have died in Washington state because of COVID. Um, it seems like they really weren't addressed much in our testimony tonight. There is a medical emergency and people are at risk and it is incumbent on us to act in a very quick manner. Um, I understand there might be impacts. Those impacts may not be as great as lives and we are dealing with lives. And if you're not worried about the homeless, if the hospital is filled and you can't get a bed in there, I think you might be concerned um, about our community as a whole. That being said, a number of methods are being proposed specific for this use. First, we're blessed in the sense that the public market site has a far better physical layout. In the sense, one of our challenges on Holly Street was the folks in the right of way in the right of way, there's nothing the mission can do to address behaviors that occur there. Folks know they can't be trespassed. They know they can't be moved on. In the design of the new location, for example, in adaptive design, the fence is held back 10 feet. The fence line would be on the property. Folks can be trespassed. One of the problems at the Holly Street location was dealing with folks who are hangers on, camping in their cars, um, many barred from the use of attending the mission. We've proposed a method where we would, dis we would disperse that. We wouldn't have overnight camping or overnight parking in the immediate area. I understand the concerns about the Bellingham High School. As many of you know, I live across the street from the Bellingham High School, probably one of the most affected neighbors. And yes, there are impacts. But in our urgency to get that facility studied, we hadn't had the time to establish conditions like we're proposing for the public market cooperative conditions that involve the business community, that involve the police department, that involves the mission and city staff. And to council member Lilliquist's charge, it is our responsibility to ensure that we get adequate programs, such as the cleanup of the areas that are surrounding, such as um, ensuring that we have good security um, and protect both the residents and the businesses to the greatest extent possible. I believe those matters can be addressed. You know, folks talk about the adverse effect of shelters. Pioneer Square has one of the largest shelters in Seattle. That's Light Union Gospel, Light Union Gospel Mission. And it's immediately adjacent to some of the most expensive real estate and most successful commercial uses. You've been there, right? It can work. It takes a hell of a lot to make it work and we're committed to do so in our process. Thank you, Rick, Holly, and then Hannah. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, so I have been a downtown business owner for nine years. Uh, before that, a downtown person. I've always been a downtown person, love downtown, very protective of downtown and its businesses and its people, and have, have affected uh, businesses that I love and the, love the people within those businesses near this, um, near this area. And so uh, I, you know, I spent a lot of time reading those emails and taking them all very seriously, uh, reading every single comment and with an open mind. And um, certainly the presentation today has solidified that this is our only option. It's very clear. Staff has worked really hard to make it clear that it's our only option and that, that we're thinking very deeply about how to make this work uh, for everybody. Um, 
the relationship between this location, the drop-in center at this location and our downtown in part is dependent on our downtown community and what we do as a downtown community uh, to interact with or not with, uh, with our neighbors in the drop-in center. Um, the downtown that I love, I think can flip this narrative as one speaker said and welcome our neighbors um, and make the best of the situation. And I would hope um, become a neighborhood that's really proud to have this drop-in center um, amongst us. So, um, but the one thing that I do wanna emphasize is we, we can't stop listening to the needs of the businesses around here. They're already struggling and hurting and worried. And this is just one layer of worry on top of that. Um, so, uh, but thank you to the staff for already doing a lot of that work. Councilmember Stone. Thank you, President Knudsen. Um, so some of these things have already been said, but I wanna reiterate the fact that the, the city and the county have come together to do due diligence um, to try and identify locations. And even if we weren't all engaged in all of that background work that had to be done, I feel confident that they dug deep to try and find a location. And you've heard from fellow council members about the struggle for five years or longer to try and find locations. Um, and so timing is everything. And I feel like right now, obviously we're up against the wall where I don't think it's acceptable or even an option to consider not going forward because we would be faced with at least a week gap, right? There was a request to wait until the 24th, but if you're looking at a week's gap where members of our community would be out on the streets and without a place to stay, I don't think that's, that's an option that we can consider. Um, and so going forward, I think what, you know, the speaker, Laura um, Christensen tonight, just saying that, yes, to try and change that narrative and to, to think of this as an opportunity. So I too have read all of the emails and comments and voicemail messages and spoken with community members personally about their concerns. Um, and what I'm asking and looking at is that COVID-19 for as much havoc as has been sort of wreaked on the community and will continue to do so, it's also providing us with an opportunity. We've struggled to find locations for years, but right now this is providing us with an opportunity and an opportunity to do better. The restrictions imposed by COVID-19 are forcing us to provide members of the community who happen to be unsheltered with more space when they are at the drop-in center Right? They're also provided with stability where you're not packing up your belongings every morning, leaving to be on the street and then coming back in the evening to wait in line to re-enter. You have that stability, your possessions and things are in one place. And you also have increased security where you know where your possessions are. There's additional staff on hand and we're doing better. And what I'm asking from the business community, I understand it's a lot to ask and you're up against um, recovering, the economic recovery that we're gonna face as a community but I don't want you to be put off if we move forward and vote to move forward tonight. I don't want you to throw your hands up and walk away. I want you to commit to, to go through this with us together. And so there's a 15 day comment period, as well as the public meeting that was discussed by the mayor that will be held on June 24th at 5 p.m. I wanna hear from community members, business members, residents um, who are in the area about what can we do collectively to help mitigate? What are your specific concerns? What can we do to make that site successful? Um, because we're not walking away from this, right? I mean, I think this is a commitment that over the next few years, we're gonna be in this together. And I want that accountability to be there. Um, that yes, it sounds good on paper right now that we wanna make sure things are mitigated and that this doesn't have a negative impact. Um, but I know there are doubters and so I want to make sure that we do our part to make sure that this is a success. So thank you. Thank you, Hannah. I'm gonna take a stab at it here real quick. I wanna go down memory lane a little bit and I'm gonna go back to 1989. 1989, we had a very um, serious homeless problem. We had people living in their cars. Uh, it was a big concern at city council that year. I almost ran that year, I did not. But what the city did was sponsor a homeless shelter at the old Sears and Roebuck Auto Building. And I think one of the reasons some of the old time uh, business people are a little worried about this is what happened back then. It did not work very well. The city tried to run it itself. 
it, it just really did not go very well. We didn't have the Lighthouse Mission with us. We didn't have the county with us. The city took it on all by themselves and proved that we cannot do this alone. And then in 1993, when I ran, that was four years later, we had more people living in their cars and out in the streets, bothering businesses and everything else. So then, as Pinky mentioned, 2015, what happened in 2015? We had the first tent city in front of City Hall. It was only gonna be there for a weekend. It was there for two weeks. Then we had the back lot at City Hall for a couple of months. And then finally, working with the county and the city and tiny homes, the lettered streets opened their arms to that, to those people coming over there and living. Then Fairhaven tiny homes then Bellingham High School. Now we're at a different point. But time and time again, with the Lighthouse Mission's involvement, with our city staff doing everything that they've done on this, I fully understand people's concerns. Um, it's, there's a lot of concern about it, but there's more concern if we do nothing. There's a more concern if we don't have these shelters. If we'd have had shelters many, many years ago, who knows, maybe we could have bent the curve to where we're at now. But I just think, all the emails that came in and all the testimony, we all appreciate it. We understand your feelings. I just hope you have trust in all of us in the staff and the Lighthouse Mission. I've been driving by the Lighthouse Mission for 46 years at my job. I know a lot of people that have been there, that have had to stay there and have worked at the place that I work at and I've driven them home. These are everyday people. I volunteered at the food bank where people that I've worked with that have to go to the food bank and get food because they don't make enough money. So I know this whole story and it's, we just can't sit back and miss this opportunity. I just hope that people and especially the, the business people have faith that this is gonna work. It's, we've had some setbacks, but this one here has an opportunity with the county, the city and the lighthouse mission to, to really work well, because if we don't act, it's going to be worse. Michael. Well, first, Gene, um, thanks. There were some good comments from the heart. Um, I appreciated them. Um, I want to go kind of back to where I was before. There are several kind of aspects of this agreement. City and county have already agreed to put up the money for a shelter somewhere, but not this one. There's a separate regulatory process on the um, uh, encampment permit that the lighthouse will be involved in. Council has no role in that. That's a land use regulatory process. It follows rules that are already written down. I wanna turn to the sublease. I don't, I'm looking through the, the documents. Did we see the conditions in the sublease or did we just see the sublease conditions summarized in the memo? Because I was, I wanted to review the those sublease terms because that has to do with again the point the councilmember Hamill said that uh, how this thing is operated and and the point I made how what how we um, sort of uh, police the impacts and address the impacts if we don't uh, if, we, if we if they do occur um, have we seen the sublease uh, terms and conditions are they in the packet will we see those sublease terms and conditions or will that be handled um, based on feedback from us at an administrative level. Right, so the, there's a summary of the sublease terms in your memo. We have attached the conditions that are draft right now that based on uh, Rick and the chiefs and Hans's experience doing this before, there's a number of conditions, there's several pages of conditions and what we're proposing is that we attach those. It's a little unique, but given the situation and the feedback, we would attach the conditions as part of the sublease agreement with the Lighthouse Mission. And then next, um, the planning department's gonna start the permitting process. And they're gonna be working with the neighborhood. There's that neighborhood meeting that's next week that has to do with the permit, not the action we're asking of city council. Um, and then those conditions might be modified or additional conditions might come online. And so the sublease will be written such that if there's any additional revisions or conditions, um, they will be subject to those as well. So they'll be subject to them here in the lease agreement, but also in a permit. Did I get that right, Peter? Tara, where is that summarized? Do you have the page numbers? 
Thank you. So the summary, the summary of the lease, sublease agreement starts on page 15. And on page 16, uh, number eight, the last sentence says key operational conditions. And that's what we're referring to. Similar to those identified above where I reference, sorry, I reference them. Um, will be incorporated into the sublease. And then the conditions, Michael, again, they're draft, but they're based on the experience of staff and based on the, the feedback that, that we've been getting online. Those start on page 22 and they go through your packet of page 27. Okay. Um, Councilwoman Vargas has her hand, hand up. Thank you, Council President. Um, I'm going to believe in the um, optimism that we can do this right. And I'm going to make a motion for the consideration of the lease terms uh, for the temporary shelter at 1530 Cornwall. Second. Motion been made by, hang on, Peter. Motion been made by Councilmember uh, Vargas, seconded by Councilmember Hample. Uncle Rafato. Yeah, thank you. Just to be clear, I want to ensure that the recommended action is fully understood by Council. It's to recommend that Council approve the essential elements of the lease and the sublease as outlined in the packet. Is that what you're doing, Piggy? I, I am in acknowledgement of that, and that is the motion. Thank you. Okay. Motion been made and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor will say aye. 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 All those opposed, motion carries unanimously. Now the next <laughs> You wanna say anything, Hans? I just wanna say thank you for the 160 people that are gonna have a place to be. Thank you. This is gonna be uh, an incredible endeavor and it's going to address homelessness in our community for the next few years in a significant, serious way. And I just appreciate it. And I appreciate your effort and your partnership and your support of Lighthouse Mission. Thank you, sir. Okay, the next item is a resolution exempting the drop-in center at 1530 Cornwall Avenue from state building code requirements in order to provide housing for indigenous persons consistent with the provisions of RCW. And I scribbled on it, so I don't know what the RCW is. 1927042. 1927042. Thank you, Rick. Okay, um, that's you. Go ahead. If I can, members of the council, uh, this matter comes before you and it would apply to both the COVID emergency shelter, uh, which becomes effective based on the mayor's order and the signed lease, as well as the subsequent permit for the emergency shelters, tem the temporary encampment. And that will uh, take effect later. Um, and just to clarify, um, the action of moving in and these conditions are um, on an emergency basis. The reason we're doing the temporary encampment permit is to ensure if the emergency ended, and we hope it does, um, there would not be an inconsistency with our laws and the conditions would continue until the lease was over. Um, towards that end, we've had both the fire marshal and the building inspector, um, the building official, um, go through the subject properties. And there is provision in state law that says if both the fire marshal and the building official agree that through the provision of fire watch and extinguishers and exiting, um, the building can be made safe, that those buildings that are used for the indigent, those who are unsheltered, can be occupied without strict compliance with the building code. So the things that are waived largely are some of the residential requirements for sprinklers and other means. But I assure you, uh, based on the advice of our fire marshal and building official, it is a safe premise. And if council um, considers and takes action on the task resolution, it would allow um, concurrent time for the leasehold we have for that building to be used um, without strict compliance with the building code. Happy to answer any questions you might have. Any questions? Does anybody have a motion? I'm going to go ahead and move approval of, of this uh, agenda bill item. Okay. Council Member Hamill moves approval. Council Member Vargas seconded. Lisa, you wanted to say something? No? 
You're unmute yourself there, Lisa. I was just seconding. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So is there any further? Go ahead, Pinky. I just wanted to clarify, Rick, this is what we did for the original drop-in center, correct? We have um, done this for the drop-in center. We've done it for the shelter at Civic Field. This um, is not the first time. It's not the first time. It's a great provision of state law to uh, ensure safety, but allow um, us to address an emergent need. Thank you. Okay, any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor will say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Mayor Fleetwood, do you want to say any final words? No, I just want to thank everyone's participation tonight, including the people that gave comment and um, express my gratitude to the staff for the hard work that they did. Thank you all. Thank you, I have to uh, take this time to thank Monet. It was Monet that got the computer started for me. I don't know what the heck I was doing, but she got it started me and, and Mark's help. But I'm a little concerned now because Pinky, a second ago, I saw a black cat on your lap. Now I'm gonna get lost when I get home. So thank you very much for that. Okay, with nothing further to come before the meeting, our next council meeting will be Monday, June 22nd at 7 p.m. Meeting adjourned. Bye, folks.